Hello and welcome to It's Q&A Friday Yeah In fact, it's the last Q&A Friday for a while It's the last recording I do for a while So... Welcome, this is Let Me Boy to Sleep. My name is Jason Newland. Please only listen when you can safely close your eyes. If you would like to help me out, please uh, you can send me a PayPal gift if you'd like to help. That would be groovy. Uh, <laughs> um, looking at Vinny, he's got his ears perked up. He's listening. He's listening for an opportunity to bark. The window's open, but the door's closed. I have to have some air floating around here. I don't like sitting in a stuffy room. Because imagine it gets stuffy. There's me, I'm like 95, practically turning into dust. So it gets very dusty in here. And he's a dog, constantly farting. And there's a dog that's barking in the, in the garden. He's been barking all day and he hasn't barked back. But now that I'm making this recording, guaranteed, almost guaranteed, he'll start barking. So, oh, you what? Oh, you're not making a recording. So, I won't be making a recording until this is my plan the 1st of December. So, it's now the 8th. Is it the 8th? It's the 8th of November. So the reason, there's a couple of reasons actually. Um, I haven't been too well lately. So uh, we're coming up to the anniversary of my friend passing away. So I know I'm not going to be in a great space. I'm not in a great space leading up to that, to be fair. It's something I'm thinking about quite a bit. And other things going on. But the main thing really is my university course I am pretty much three weeks behind and I've got 13 days in order to complete this part of the course I think it's the 22nd of November it has to be in the assignment the assessment assignment thing they call it a TMA two, two term marked assignment I think so it's either quit the course or do the work that's the two options I've got so I decided to do the work starting from tomorrow so I'm going to devote the next 13 days to doing the course and then I'm going to take the following week off just to <laughs> recover from all of that intensive study. Now I probably don't need to put this much effort in, but I want it I want to get good marks. Even though it kind of doesn't matter as long as I pass, that's all I need to do. But I wanna just for myself, I wanna get a like a really good mark. So I am gonna put everything into it. So that's it really, uh, there's no big, big thing going on, I'm just, there's no drama or anything, it's not like, I'm leaving Facebook, rah, 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 although, I think there are quite a few people that want to leave Facebook, because it's getting a little bit repetitive at the moment, um, I think you know what I mean, those that visit Facebook, there's a lot of, uh, non-friendliness should we say it's it's definitely been a trigger for a lot of people some of the stuff that's happened in certain parts of the world but then you think of what's going on in other parts of the world I mean blimey you know no matter how political and how whatever in this country Blimey, 
There's someone screaming in the garden. Not in a garden, but... Wow. Don't know what that was. But I... I just think, and that's just like... You know, Spain, for example. I mean, that's just... You know, I don't, want, I don't like to talk about horrible things that happen, but you can't help but have your heart go out to people that have gone through such a, like, horrible thing. I, mean, I know it's like last week, and I think they had something this week as well. But we don't get the full news on stuff like that. Because as soon as anything in America happens, the news goes to that. As soon as anything, like, political in this country, the news goes to that. Then the news is very much more interested in focus on that than it is on other countries. And we, the only country we read the news really focuses on is America. Right. <laughs> Vinny started barking. I knew he would. So I don't even remember what I was talking about. What was I talking about? Yeah, so I think that was it. Just I'm um, focusing on my course for the next 13 days and then I'm going to take a little break and then I'll be back in December. Now, those that listen to me regularly will probably realise that that possibly won't happen and tomorrow I'll just decide to quit the course or something else will happen and I just thought I'll end up making another recording tomorrow you know who knows but my plan is not to make any anything I'll make this recording I will probably upload it in the morning because it's 8 o'clock now I like to be in bed by 10 so that's kind of what's going on so 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 I hope everything's fine right so this is so, I keep saying so, I've got to stop saying so. So, no, no, see, I don't even mean to, I, I, I also want to say um, thank you to Kara for your message. It's very kind of you. And also, I want to send well wishes to Molly, who starts treatment in the next couple of weeks, I think. Um, I'm not going to be around but if you need to contact me Molly then please do I hope that the recordings that I've made over the last few weeks the the specific you know special ones I hope that they've been useful to you I hope so I wish you well and um, yeah so there's four questions I've got I got Ali Dimitri Anne and Kara. So I'm going to start off with Ali. That's the first question. So I'll start off with Ali. So Ali asks me if the country you lived in was a democracy and you had the power to elect anyone, Vinny included, to be your president, who would you allow the power? I do live in a democracy. The UK is a democracy, but it's it's a little bit different because we have, or well, we have a monarchy. So, and it's going to sound like I know what I'm talking about, but I'm going to read this off Google. Okay, the United Kingdom is a constitutional monarchy which, by legislation and convention, operates as a unitary parliamentary democracy. So, it's. It's a democracy and everything's pretty much run by the parliament, by the prime minister and everything. Laws have to go through the House of Lords to be passed. So they'll vote on it. You know, for those that don't know, though, if it's a new law, it's a big, big process. So it's... I mean, I don't think even in places like America I don't think you could vote a dog in I don't think don't comment <laughs> don't comment this is not a political I'm not making a any kind of uh, remark I'm just saying I think it's 
there has to be humans, I think. So I this country is a democracy. But if the thing is I've got, I've got like there's part of me would say I want to be in power. And in this country it's a prime minister, not a president. Uh, which is weird because some countries have both. I think in France, I think in France they have a president and a prime minister. Maybe even in Germany. But in this country it's just a prime minister. Which is equivalent of a prime, of a, as a president. There is no one higher than, well, the king, I guess. But the king doesn't have power, really. Or if he does, he does have the power, but he doesn't use it because he knows he's not allowed to. So if, for example, when they passed the recent rules through saying that uh, they took away benefits for pensioners for getting a heat, uh, like a, a bill payment, so to go towards their electric and gas bill. And the, you know, it was a big uproar and the Prime Minister wouldn't back down and they still put it through so that they, a lot of people weren't going to get that payment. If the King had decided to stick his oar in and decided to put his foot down and say, nope, I disagree with what you're doing there, then it could potentially be the end of the Royal Family <laughs> because although they do have the power I don't think they really do have the power you know it's it's a lot of tradition it's almost the the, pri the new, whenever there's an election the Prime Minister has to be accepted by the monarch the king and it used to be the queen but now it's the king so but what would happen if when the the, the latest Prime Minister and how many have we had this year? <laughs> the latest this year had gone to the king to, you know, after he'd won the election and said, you know, to get his blessing. And the king said, no, I don't want you. I want that other fellow. Would have made no difference because he doesn't, the power is almost, um, I don't know. Not methodic, myth I don't know what the right word is. It's sort of like um, pretend, pretend power. Not like the old days when the kings were king. You know, they had control. They had the power. They made the laws. It's not like that anymore in this country. So we are a democracy. But still with the pretense of going through the ceremony of asking permission from the king even though they don't need permission from the king. Not really. You know, it's, it's a weird one. So, who would I... I think it should be. I think president sounds better than prime minister. But then, thinking about it, we kind of created that whole thing, didn't we? <laughs> I think England... <laughs> I don't know if it's true. Um, but we, we were one of the first democracies in the world one of the first I don't know let's say who is the first democracy I'll find that out I'm not going to use Google I'm going to go to chat GBT because I'm going to get a better uh, um, response oh okay cancel cancel what am I doing blimey okay who was the first okay well I'm going to talk into it can I yeah I can yeah I can Right. Right. Which countries were the first democracy? Okay. The first democracies. So, yeah, it wasn't the UK. It was Greece. Greece, then Athens. And then England. So... Yeah, so Greece was kind of, I think, their class. I thought it was. 
Um, Because, yeah, so Greece and Athens and because, let's face it, Romans used to own this country, didn't they? So I think Romans possibly bought it here. So, and then we took it to America. And (laughs) I don't know. So, yeah, we were one of the first in the whole world to be, we were a democracy long before America was long before America was even thought of so you know from a outside perspective because obviously they had their original people that lived there uh, I don't know what kind of uh, law system they had it should have been don't allow any people onto your land but they weren't to know were they so I think who would I like to be See, I I always used to think that a good person to be in charge is a very successful business person. And I thought about that, like in America. I thought someone like uh, Amazon Man or... Bill Gates or I know it's controversial because it's not my country so I've got no say in it I've got no toes in that particular bowl of soup but if someone that's super successful I mean no one can argue that Bezos Mr Amazon is one of the most successful businessmen business people in the entire history of the world He's up there with Ford and Rockefeller and, you know, those people that were magnets hundreds of years ago. He's, you know, he's, his company is, I think, the third biggest company in the entire world, Amazon. So he's done quite well for himself. And I thought... Like, who's she talking? That's another really loud person. What would it be like? Do you think people, loud people, know that they're loud? Do you reckon they do? Do you reckon they know how loud they are? Because I see people with the talking and they're literally, I don't know, three foot away from someone and they're talking to them like they're at the other side of a football field. Why? <laughs> Why? So I used to, I kind of thought someone that's really successful would be the correct person to take over or to be a, pre- a president or a prime minister because they've got the business sense. But then that wouldn't, I don't know, I guess that wouldn't be a democracy. But it still is a democracy, just still in like, because a democracy doesn't mean just one person can do whatever they want. Although, I think some people believe that. Almost like, well, one person is now in charge. The whole world is going to change and that one person gets to do whatever they want. No, it doesn't work like that. They have to have the backing of a lot of other people. They can't just say, this is a new rule. No, they have to have the backing So in the UK, it's basically, there's two main parties. There's the Tories or the uh, Conservatives and Labour. Labour currently in power. So Labour has the most amount of people. Conservatives has the next amount, biggest amount. And then you've got Liberal Democrats and... SMP and you know Scottish National Party there's the a few independent people there's the Green Party and there's the Nigel Farage Party the the Boat People Party and he even if you you know 
you can never have more you just can't you're never going to have all the people in the party you're never going to be able to you put a vote a vote through like let's say you decide you want to make a change to the law and you get everyone in in the house of parliament to vote for it all the mps have to vote and then the more people you've got on your side the more chance you're going to win that vote so in america they've got a bigger chance to pass things because they've got a bigger chunk of people but also in this country as well uh, we've got labor have got the bigger group of people but not everyone in labor agrees with what the prime minister wants to do because ultimately it's not about labor it's every mp they've got their own constituency their own town that they're they're like they're the prime minister of their own town kind of so if their town wants you know if if the government want to put something through that's going to have a big effect on that town then that person is not going to vote with their own party because it goes against their constituents and that's who their most the most important person to an MP outside of their own family of course and friends is the constituents the people in their town so you know if if the if the government's voting for a new railway system to be put through you know to go through and but it's going to go through someone's town and take away half of the of the town because they're going to dig it up and they're going to have to force people to move out so that the railway line can go through and it ruins that town that mp is not going to vote with the government but if they don't vote with the government they might get sacked crazy isn't it like that's not a democracy a democracy is you got a f- you should be able to vote whichever way you want to vote not be forced to vote just because the prime minister is going a certain way <sighs> right i'll let that down now i'll put that down <laughs> i never understood it i follow it a little bit i just just like doesn't make sense you can't tell people how to vote of course if someone keeps voting against your party and they're in your party like why are they in your party but if there's a legitimate reason you know for example i don't know if uh, any kind of uh, mp exists or politician exists that's against war but if there was one and they wanted to vote against i don't know, for example giving missiles to a country that is just going to completely bombard another country then that politician may say no i don't vote for this but then we all know that that stuff never gets voted for does it no that just goes through so who would i i'd like to be in charge of everything but unfortunately i would be a hardliner so i wouldn't be a good one i'm not a hardliner in life but i think i would be super strict if i was in charge i know i'd be terrible i the power i think the power the power's going to my head now and it's just an imagination and i'm still thinking okay who would i put who would i who would i put in prison who would i release who would i you know no yeah, i couldn't it wouldn't be right for me to do something like that vinny i mean what would what would he do everybody has to give him treats he'd be the fattest jack russell in the history of the world within about a month everyone would have to leave their door front doors open so he could come and go as he please everyone's door so if he wants to or no doors in fact there wouldn't be any doors he hates doors so he would come and go as he please every house belongs to him and there needs to be food that he can get to sausages meat anything he wants has to be available for him in every single house so 
yeah, I de- he probably wouldn't be the greatest. He'd probably still make a better Prime Minister than me. But I... I'd be a little bit too reactive, I think. You know, especially with drivers. I've got a little thorn in my uh, hoof over the old uh, drivers sometimes. Just the amount of people that don't indicate or the speed. People at speed. I just never understood. Why, why do we sell cars that can go 120 miles an hour when the speed limit, I think, is 80 on a motorway? 70 or 80, it's the most you're allowed to go. And 60 on a normal road is the most you're going to go. Why have a car that can do double that? So, when I was a, when I was younger, I used to think that what would be good is if a car went over this, it broke the speed limit, then it just it, there was a like something inside that just automatically explode. But that probably wouldn't be good for road safety, would it? So here's me thinking: How can I make the road safer? Exploding cars on a motorway probably wouldn't be it. That's why I shouldn't be in charge of anything, because. I'm just too emotional baby so yeah I don't know I think um, I've never really say that I've particularly enjoyed any of the prime ministers that we've had during my lifetime the only person that I liked I really liked was uh, a Labour MP called John Smith and he was the leader of the Labour Party in the 90s I think probably about 94 95 he passed away suddenly and Tony Blair took over the leadership and then he went on to win the the uh, you know premiership or whatever you want to call it to become Prime Minister and how many people (laughs) perished I don't know so it's it was kind of a I think John Smith was a really nice person but the problem is your hands are tied I think anyone that has that job and thinks they're going to be in control I think they're deluded because they're not in control because they have to do they've got to toe the line they can't just do whatever they want. There's no one in the world that can just do whatever they want. Or those that do just do whatever they want end up in prison. Unless, of course, if you do whatever you want, is something that's not going to harm anyone, then, yeah, you can do whatever you want. But the Prime Minister, with all the best intentions, have to... We have to appease America because America are really our only ally. Most of the world don't particularly like England, I don't think. And NATO and all the countries, Europe, you know, we stick together. But ultimately, we have a close relationship with America. And I think out of all the countries probably in the world, I would say... America's closest to Ireland and the UK and I'm not sure how Canada works because I mean it's the same landmass isn't it so I thought that they would have got on but I don't know and I'm trying to think some other countries Israel seems to be a close close country for America It's, you know, you'd think though, imagine with the landmass that America's got, well, the Americas, let's say. So you've got uh, Canada and Mexico and all the, that area, that whole landmass. If they kind of just got together, imagine what kind of place it could be. You know, how, how thriving it could be. Because. They already kind of rule the world, America. So 
why not just create a, a paradise? I don't know. I just think, because I think of all the, look what Dubai has done with the deserts. Dubai was a desert. And now it is a paradise. It is it's the most advanced city in the entire world. They even make islands. They go out to sea and they make islands and build on that. It's just it's phenomenal what they've done. They do use a heck of a lot of water. But then seawater can be turned, can be purified. So if that's the case, which it is the case, we never need to run out of water. If seawater can be purified, urine, wee wee, can be purified and turned into water. Even poo poo can be, <laughs> it's true apparently, poo poo can be turned into water. Drinking water. I've seen Bill Gates do it. And he, he paid for this machine to be built in, I think it might have been either India or Africa. And I can't, I think it was Africa, some somewhere in Africa. But yeah, it's a huge, big, big machine. And you, you only see the last bit where he drinks the water. And there's a look on his face, which was like, hmm, I didn't know I was going to have to drink it. <laughs> I don't mind paying you know, hundred million dollars for this, but do I really have to drink it? See, I only saw the end bit. You didn't see him sitting on the toilet at the back of it, you know, didn't <laughs> doing a poo. So they missed that bit out. I think it only works if you don't know where it comes from. You know, I think if it, if we had a system like that in your house and you said to your husband or whatever for example I'm thirsty I really could do a drink of water alright honey will you go into the kitchen and I'll go into the toilet and I'll squeeze one out and just wait a couple of minutes you know it takes takes like an hour no <laughs> takes uh, takes a minute to process but I'll let you know when I've done I'll let a few grunts out and then just, you know, wait and I'll let you know and just then you'll be able to get some water. Oh, OK, thanks. Do you want some? No, you're all right, mate. No, it's fine. <laughs> nah, nah, uh, nah, I just I just just stick to dust. No, you're fine. Oh, no, no. Milk only. Milk and dust. <laughs> so. I. I think it's amazing some of the things that we could do if people would just get along this whole world could be transformed I mean if a desert can be turned into the most advanced city in the world then anything is possible anything and that kind of goes back to why I think the billionaires should not should but maybe it might be worth and when I say billionaires I'm talking like the really 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 bitch bi bitch <laughs> rich billionaires um, the ones that are creators the ones that are inventors or geniuses um, so I've, and I was for Elon Musk but now Elon Musk has got involved in politics so I'm wondering is the next move to change the rules so that people no longer do you have to be born in America to be the president which means the next president will be Elon Musk or it might be a, a fight between Elon and uh, Amazon man so that's kind of you know, it's it's an interesting thing. It's interesting to me as a an observer. But then I just think, hmm. I wonder 
Because if they did do that, if they did change the rules, well, you know, did you know your next, one of your next, if you're in America, one of your next presidencies might be one of our former prime ministers. So Boris Johnson, he could apply to become the the president of the United States if he wanted to. And so you might be thinking, now how could he be? He's a prime minister. He was born in New York. He was um, born in the New York uh, airport, I think. But I don't know if it's true. But he was definitely born in America. So he is American. Well, American English. Or American UK. Or American British, whatever the correct term is. So he could, if he wanted to, apply to become the president. And if you never... I think he would... He's kind of... I think he'd be quite popular in America. And he's still relatively young. He's, he's still... He's not... I don't think he's much much older than me. Yeah, I'm calling myself young. Thank you. So that'd be interesting. So back to the question, which there was a question, wasn't there? What was it? If the country you lived in was a democracy, it is a democracy, uh, you had the power to elect anyone. I mean, it's a democracy, but it's not in a way that we could just say... The, you can't... Oh, I'm trying to think. Yeah, basically... You have to be the leader of the party to become prime minister. Being an MP, anyone can apply to be an MP. I can apply to be an MP if I wanted to in my local district. And I think you have to pay a certain amount of money. And if you get enough votes, you get your deposit back. So you put a deposit of like 250 quid or whatever it is. Might be more than that. And if you get enough votes, you get your deposit back. And if you don't, you don't. If you get the most votes, you become a member of the ha- a member of parliament. Now, but if you're just an independent, you can never be prime minister if you're an in- independent, because you have to be a leader of a party. Because a prime, though, as far as I know, maybe I'm wrong there, but I don't think. It's ever on a list of independent people applying to be prime minister. Because you need to be a leader of part. The party has to be you the party with you. <laughs> has to be a party, man. So yeah, I would I definitely wouldn't have voted for Shakira that we've got here. So we've got Shakira as the Shakira, Shakira, Starmer is the Prime Minister here at the moment. We do tend to go through them, so the chances of him seeing the whole four or five years through, I don't know. We've now got Kerry Baddock, Baddock, whatever, who is the first female black leader of the Conservative Party, so she's the opposition. So she's the first. The thing is, we had the first Asian Prime Minister with, I forget his name now, who was a Prime Minister before. And so it's, there's a lot of, we, it, you know, before Thatcher, there was never a female Prime Minister. And now there's been, how many? One, two, three, four female prime ministers. No, there hasn't. There's been one, two, three prime ministers, female prime ministers now. And two of those were in the, were in the same year, I think. So with, you know, within a couple of years of each other. Or maybe three years of each other. Was it? Yes, yeah, three. 
Theresa May and the other one. So, yeah, I think... Who would I like to be in power? I think people need to be tested. You know, let them have some power. But if they don't do a very good job, then... Because the public don't get to choose. You get to choose the... I mean, ultimately, the Prime Minister now, we can't kick the Prime Minister out. The, the, the public can't kick him out. His party can kick him out. The, the Parliament can put him up as being useless and eventually he, he'd have to quit. But then the government, or the, the Labour Party as it is at the moment, would choose in their own group who to choose to be the next Prime Minister. The public wouldn't get a choice in that, the general public, just the members of the Labour Party, which is not a fair thing. It's not doesn't seem very fair to me. So that doesn't seem very democratic. So, yeah, that, that's that's what I would say for that. I want to be in control. I want to be the boss. And... I'd make some changes. I'd get rid of the TV license. That's just ridiculous. There's a law in this country now, right? Not in now. It's been like that for years. They they, they enforce it and they really go hard on people. And you people end up with like £1,000 fines for not having a TV license. When you only pay, right? Are you, are you ready for this? Out of all the channels on the TV, and there's a lot, a lot of channels now. Out of all the channels, we're only paying for two channels. BBC One and BBC Two. That's the only two channels you're paying for. But you can't watch any of the others without a TV licence. How is that fair? It's ridiculous. The TV licence money doesn't go to ITV, doesn't go to Channel 4, doesn't go to Channel 5, doesn't go to ITV2, doesn't go to any of the other channels it goes to BBC One or it goes to the BBC so any channel that the BBC's got yet we're not allowed to watch Channel 4 not allowed to live watch live TV at all unless you've got TV licence and you know it's like Netflix managed to offer a service Amazon managed to offer a service. Sky TV manages to offer, you know, stuff without with, what with a box, you know, with a like thing you just get it through the internet. So you pay for that separate. It's a, a separate thing, which is a lot cheaper than a TV license, and you get a lot more. But the BBC. Now they won't do that because they know that not, who's going to pay for it. If suddenly they remove the two channels from the TV, so everyone can continue watching TV like before, no TV license, but they'll have to pay subscription to watch BBC. How much money are they going to get in? A few thousand a year, probably. How many people are going to pay to watch BBC? I reckon not many. To start with, probably a few. But they won't be able to charge the amount they charge now. Like nearly £2,000 a year, is it? Something like that. No, it's not. It's about... What is it? What's a TV licence? Let me check. A TV licence. Okay. Right, so... Cost of the TV licence, UK... So it is one thousand. Blimey. Can you believe this? For a colour television, one thousand. Oh, it's not one thousand. Blimey. No, it's a hundred and sixty nine pound fifty for a colour television, fifty seven pound for black and white television. Where can you get a black and white television from? Someone tell me. 
where can you buy a black and white television? So I pay monthly and it works out £14.12 a month or something. I rarely watch BBC. I watch the news. I do watch the news channel. But I skip between news, BBC, Sky, GB News. Um, I used to watch the, a couple of other U news channels, but they I think they've been taken off. So I just skip between them just to see what's happening. Uh, and then go into YouTube. I can get news from there as well. But I don't, I don't watch BBC very often. Like the actual channels. So, yeah. So I'd get rid of that. And I would... What else would I do? You see, this this I would be very unpopular because everyone everyone would be like, brilliant, that's great. And then, <laughs> guess what else? I would put a speed limit on every road. Uh, probably 20 miles an hour, 30 miles an hour on a motorway. 20 miles maximum on every other road other than a motorway. I know, probably 90% of the people listening to this would get angry at that. It's not real, it's just fantasy, so don't worry. Um, but I, yeah. I would ban alcohol. That's 100% now. <laughs> I'd ban all alcohol, because it's ridiculous. I mean, I definitely, oh, you're not allowed to be over the limit. You're not allowed to drink and... You are, you're allowed to drink and drive in this country. You're allowed, legally allowed to drink and drive. You're allowed to go to the pub, drink alcohol and drive home. Providing you're under, a, under the limit. And I think it's like maybe a pint. Maybe a pint and a half. I don't know what the limit is. It's going to depend upon the body, person's body as well. How well they absorb the alcohol, I guess. But I've always been a lightweight, so I reckon a half a shandy would probably put me over the limit. So instead of having, excuse me, instead of having a law like that, which is so ridiculous, you know, leaving it up to someone that's drinking to try and figure out if they've had too much or not, just ban alcohol but drink, drink and drive and completely ban it so people are not allowed to drink and drive so you know there's a a blow thing that you have to do blow the person downstairs are doing the washing up and it's almost like they're banging the stuff the pots and pans really banging it on purpose to make as much noise as possible <laughs> I think they might be having a bit of a tantrum yes so I, so I'd ban drinking, dry, drinking and driving because this is ridiculous. Why would you just just stop it altogether? I would go even further and probably ban alcohol. But then that would cause problems. I just, I don't think alcohol is useful. I, just, I don't personally think it's a useful thing. I'd be quite hard line with drugs as well. Even though I would be a hypocrite for doing that, but I still would now. It's, it would be like zero tolerance for that stuff. But at the same time, you need to replace it with something else. You need to give people opportunities, especially like younger people, give them something a way that they can enjoy themselves without drinking. Nightclubs without alcohol. Don't they call them night um, dry clubs, I think. And the only problem with, as a, a business, having been in the industry a bit in the past, knowing how it works a little bit, is there's no money to be made unless you sell alcohol. You know, you can have a comedy club, for example, me talking about comedy game. 
you can charge £10 or £15 to get in, for example, £20, whatever it is now. But unless the people are drinking, there's no, they're not going to make any money because the rates, the especially if it's like a purpose-built club of some kind, you need people to be drinking. That's where the profit is. Food, there's profit, but it's hassle. Food is a lot of hassle. You know, alcohol is quite easy. It's just manage. It's crowd management, I guess. After that, but with food, it's just so much involved. I don't feel I'd ever want to be running anything that sold food. Have a little sandwich machine or something, and then. Oh, and I thought about that in the past, having a club that was alcohol free. But you'd have to be charging people like forty, fifty pound to come in. Or I okay, can't. I just think how much would they spend on alcohol? Probably twenty, thirty, forty pound each on a night. Maybe twenty pound, thirty pound. I don't know what it is. I don't know how much in London. I think a pint is like six or seven pound or ten pound now. So you're not going to get get go far with forty quid. So I was thinking, yeah, something like that would be cool. But you don't want it to be just for people with alcohol issues. Because it's the idea is for it to be fun. I mean, if you want to spend the evening hearing people tell you how all about their, how they can't drink anymore, and it's, it's probably not going to be much fun for everyone else. But if everyone's not drinking, it's just a case of like, yay. It's like having a a vegan a vegan pub or vegetarian pub, but just in a sense of we don't serve meat, but we don't just you don't just want vegans turning up because that's all we'd be talking about. <laughs> <laughs> um, and also, they won't have the energy to clap if it's a comedy club. They won't. They're like because I'll be so tired from. <laughs> That's just an old joke. I'll oh, shut up. So yeah, um, there'd be a lot of rules I would change. I thought it'd be quite good to keep kids in school for longer because there's a big thing the last few years where some parents say they can't afford. To, they're sending their kids to school without any breakfast, and of course, there's going to be situations where that is unavoidable and I mean it's illegal just thought I'd let you know that just in case you wondered but it's not just illegal from the parents perspective we all there's a law America didn't sign this law by the way they didn't they didn't sign up to this but most countries in the world did and because we're studying child child law and stuff it's the welfare for children every child has to have enough to eat and it's the law, it's like a, it's a human rights thing. And most countries signed up for it, to it. So, we're responsible for our neighbours' children to make sure that they eat. And that's a weird one, it's a weird concept maybe, but it's true. So the schools, it's not about money, it's about you give them, you make sure they've got food. And children have to be heard now. The old like, oh, children should be seen and not heard. Nope, against the law, baby. They have to have the right to be heard. You know, to have their opinions listened to. It's almost like, and I, I never can't get my head around this, it's almost like children being treated like humans and I can't like how how it's weird isn't it a weird concept so my idea would be all kids go to school before breakfast they stay there all day so they have their breakfast together they have their lunch together 
they they don't leave the the building. They can just go and sit in the you know in the the field or whatever. But they don't they don't leave the premises. And they and what happens? You've also have everything that they need comes to them as a, a dentist, a doctor. I mean, most I think most schools have nurses anyway. So a doctor comes regularly, makes sure everyone, all the kids are healthy. On like you know a yearly but that's like all year round make sure everyone's doing okay and a nutritionist to make sure they're all eating the right food have all the proper exercise not just running around playing football but also give them the opportunity to make sure that they're I suppose a little bit like being in the army but without the aggression and shouting and bullying that goes on because basically in the forces you get bullied that's that's all that is is bullying someone shouting in someone's face do this do this it's bullying and I didn't like it I was in the sea cadets and it, the whole idea of sea cadets or army cadets was to pre in a way to prepare it's like a, a fun thing, but it's also to prepare the kids to join the forces when they're old enough. And it put me off joining the forces because I didn't like being shouted at. I mean, I went there to get away from being shouted at. So, yeah, I'd, it was weird, though, because I'd still rather have a stranger shout at me than my own dad. It's weird, isn't it? I'd still rather have strangers annoying me than my own brothers it's just yeah so I still I went there for a couple of years sea cadets uh, yeah man wow I'm still in the record books in the sea cadets for the person the kid that took the longest time to get their first badge and I forget what the first badge was the first badge. Let me check this. I'm, I'm going to search for this one. What is the first Sea Cadet badge? Right, here we go. What is the first badge a Sea Cadet gets? I know one of the top ones is Able Seaman. But the first one is... A new entry. <laughs> Wow. So. I did get my. Wow. Did I. I didn't get. I must have already had the new entry badge. But so I feel I might got my new entry badge after two years. I'm sure it was a different badge to that. But it was the first actual badge. Some people like had stripes and they were they were doing really well. I just didn't do very well. And when I and so and they used to give it was almost like a grading kind of they would they would decide who had deserved to be upgraded, you know, to be uh, I suppose promoted. So probably once a month they'd have one. And they'd call out people's names and they'd go and uh, march up and salute the CO, the commanding officer. And they'd get a badge given to them and everyone would clap. So for two years, I watched everyone else get it. And it became kind of a running joke. They even started announcing my name and everyone would laugh. Because I was ne it was like it was never going to happen. I think it was Private Seaman. I don't know. It might have been Private... I think that might have been the first badge. I think New Entry was just like the first... You just automatically had that when you join, I think. Private Seaman, I think. But the night... I think it was a Friday night. We used to go on a Tuesday and a Friday evening. And however weird it was, I almost wish I was back there. 
because it mean I'd be 12 again. I was there, I started when I was 11, 12, and I finished when I was 13. And then I, then I started doing karate a couple of months later. So it's weird, I feel nostalgic about the sea cadets. I couldn't stand it. But I only went there to get out of the house. So yeah, I started before I was 11. No, I started... Did I start before I was 11? No, I started at 11. 12, 11, I can't remember. But I was there for a couple of years, I think. And I... It's weird, I feel nostalgic about it. Why is that? Marching around on a... Especially on a summer night. It was lovely, actually. I mean... There was that smell of the hat. The sweat for my head, <laughs> you know. But it was... Being part of something, I guess, in a way, felt okay. Felt kind of quite good. I mean, one of the benefits of being... It's the same thing with the karate as well. Is with the sea cadets, I got to... It wasn't just one school. Because we had two main high schools in my town. I was in the smaller one. It wasn't small, but the other one was bigger. So there was two two high schools. And there was a little bit of uh, conflict between the two. A little bit of, you know, we're better than you. And division, a bit of division. So being in the Sea Cadets, I got to meet people from the other school. So it, it undivided me in a way. Plus both my brothers went to the other school. So I got to meet quite a few of the kids that went there because they were friends of my brothers. And also, I used to go to school with a lot of the kids that went there because I was at a junior school that then went to the high school, but I moved junior schools. Admittedly, I was like nine. So it was two years earlier, but I still kind of knew some of the people that went to that school. So I was in the Sea Cadets with a lot of the kids that were from the other school. And then I was at Karate with a lot of the kids. In fact, most of the kids that went to Karate went to that school, the other school. So that was quite cool. It's, it's just nice to be in, in the mix a little bit, you know, to get to know other people. I'm hearing some weird noises. Some really strange noises. I'm just going to check my phone as I rung. Very strange. Very strange. So, I... Oh, okay. So, what have I got? Did you... How did I get told like that? So yeah, I, that's what I would do. There's a few things I'd do if I was president, but I'd, I'd name myself. Or, I'm just trying to think. A few years ago, I know this is gonna, this is coming as, this is gonna be a bit weird, what, ne what I say next. But, 30 years ago, if I was gonna choose a president, for America, I possibly would have chose Bill Cosby. It just is something about him. I just thought he was always, he, I don't know, he had, so I grew up watching him. Well, I grew up, I mean, I'd, it wasn't really till the 80s, but all the way through the 80s and the 90s and that. But he, I know it's probably, some people watched him in the 60s and the 70s 
But I always thought, so, oh, did you? One of the best headlines I ever saw was when, what was it? Oh, oh yeah. It was, what year was it? I think it was 1993. So you had Bill Clinton and George Bush Sr. They were both against each other. So George, George was the pri the president. I think he'd already served two terms, I think, at that point. I might be wrong. And Clinton was the, well, he was the next, going to be the next president. Um, but they didn't know at that point. But it was, they had the election and Clinton really did well. And he won it. But I remember the headlines in the paper. I'm not even making this up. The headlines in the Sun, which was the biggest newspaper at the time in the UK. It may still be. And it's and the headlines, big headlines saying Clinton licks Bush. That that was Clinton licks Bush. And that was the that was the headline, so basically saying Clinton beat Bush. And I wish I still had the headline because it was kind of classic headline really. So and then Dimitri asks, how did you spend your Halloween? If not our two personal question, private question, of course. There are no private questions, not when it's stuff, not really. I, that's not private, really, I don't think. How did I spend Halloween? Um, I, I was in. I was in, and I had a... F someone knocked on my door a neighbour who'd been out Halloweening with her daughter and she turned up and she was all she was dressed as Beetlejuice and I think I said to her I thought you were going to get made up so that, that made everyone laugh well it made me laugh and other than that I don't recall really doing anything because it was was it Thursday last week so I don't really recall that far back but oh, I'll talk about 1983 but last Thursday blimey yeah I didn't do anything I've never I don't recall ever having dressed up for Halloween although once no one told me that there was a fancy dress day at work once. This is what I worked in insurance. I turn up, I'm the only person wearing a shirt and tie and trousers. Everyone's gone to a lot of trouble to dress up nice. Like really, you know? And someone came up to me and said, Oh, what you come as? Why didn't you dress up? I said, I have done. He said, what, no, why didn't you dress up for Halloween? I said, I have. And people were like looking at me. There was like, everyone stopped. And someone shouted out, what have you, what have you come as? I said, a serial killer. Not one pe person laughed. It's like, because serial killers don't walk around with a big sign in their head, do they? You know, it's like, they just, they walk amongst us, apparently. I thought it was funny, but they didn't. So there you go. Halloween's a bit of a weird one because... Yeah, I don't really celebrate it. It's not... Well, we're around here, it's not... I mean, I didn't see anybody hardly at all dressed up. A few years ago I did, I saw loads, but this is almost like it's... not really a thing so much around here. Yeah, I don't know why. So yeah, nothing really. That wasn't a very good answer to your question. But yeah, I've never really it's never really been a thing for me. It's more bonfire night, you know, with the bonfire and the 
the fireworks and all that stuff. I used to like that. Halloween, I don't think we, I mean, we might have done, but I don't recall ever really having done anything like decorating the garden or anything like that. No. I think part of the reason for that is it's like for one day. I don't know why we don't mix Halloween and bonfire night in this country. Have the whole... I know it's, it's like five days separate between them, but have it all as one. It just... Yeah. Because one night... And then it's done. And all that effort for one... I don't know. I don't know. I just don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. So I didn't do anything. That's my answer. I, I can't really embark any more on that one, I'm afraid. I just didn't do anything. And sorry, that was a bit of a rubbish answer, wasn't it? Anne asks me, she says, okay, I am afraid of spiders. Do you have anything you are afraid of? Crocodiles, sharks, alligators, poisonous spiders, poisonous snakes, uh, really, really huge snakes, uh, stampeding elephants, an agitated rhinosaurus. Um, a stingray with an attitude yeah just those kinds of things volcanoes fall into a volcano I'm not pretty scared of a volcano that's erupting um, a plane that's about to crash that would that scares me yeah it's like big things really things that we should be scared of I guess I don't think it... A grizzly bear. A lion. I don't look at a lion and think, oh, you know, if I saw a lion coming to me, I wouldn't want to, like, stroke it under the chin. I would... I don't know what I would do. I would urinate myself, I imagine. So, I... It's... Yeah. Big scary animals. That's that scares me. I used to have a phobia of spiders, to the point where it was just as bad as you can get, really. To be fair, and then it dawned on me that it wasn't my phobia; it was my stepmum's phobia, and she just passed it on to me. Seeing her, this is my first stepmum, and I was watching her. I'd never had any female role model really I guess not like well kind of a you know not that I wanted to be a role model so I absolutely adored her and I watched everything she did and because she was petrified of spiders I became petrified of spiders because I thought that was the right thing to do that was the right reaction to be screaming and acting out and that and then one day I realised that it's not my phobia, it's her phobia. And I don't need to be scared of spiders. For the simple fact that I live in a country where we don't need to be scared of stuff like that. This, you know, as far as wild animals, this is a relatively f safe place to live. We don't have crocodiles. We don't have bears roaming around. We don't have lions roaming around. We don't have um, a, a lot of really badly poisonous stuff. So, I mean, there are sharks in the sea, but, you know, the sea, to be fair, they can travel, can't they? They can go from anywhere they want if the sea's warm enough. So there's no boundaries, but with... I don't think crocodiles are that good as swimmers to like f swim all the way from America or all the way from India or Africa or whatever country crocodiles live. 
So, and bears are good swimmers, but they can't reach here from where they are. Mind you, they did reach America from the Antarctic, didn't they? Yeah. There's some weird noises coming from downstairs. What am I scared of? Relationships? <laughs> Humans? Probably. Uh, I'm afraid of commitment. I'm afraid of... I'm afraid of my life being pointless. I've got a real issue with that, a real thing that I want to feel that I've done something worthwhile. That's my probably my biggest fear. I, I was scared of not having any fun, because I don't have any fun. And I don't know how to have fun, I don't think, anymore. Even when I was on holiday a couple of years back, I still didn't have much fun. I just took the, mis the, the grumpy side. I do have, like, verbal fun, and I can have a joke and a laugh, and I'm not Mr. Miserable all the time or anything, but that kind of letting myself go... Uh, on holiday kind of thing I've never been able to do that or I never felt comfortable doing that so I fear not having any fun because the last time I had any kind of regular social life or fun ended in 2001 that's the last time and that was when I that was my comedy years that was the period when I was, I did have some fun back then. So I kind of, yeah, I'd like to be in a position, I'd like to, my fear is that I, I never actually progress. That I never get to live a nice life. And by nice, I mean, I've got what I need. But to have a nice life, uh, to just to be f financially stable and to be able to, I don't know, it's hard to explain. To go traveling and to have fun. Because technically, this podcast would be a lot better if I was doing that. This Let Me Boy to Sleep would be so much better if I was travelling the world and I was doing these recordings every day. Can you imagine? I'm, to, oh, I'm, I'm on a talking on, off of a cruiser. I'm on, on a world cruise. Imagine how many stupid stories I'd have to tell you. <laughs> It'd be ridiculous. There'd be a lot of funny stories I'd have. But, I mean, yesterday, I, my podcast was about me going to the doctor's surgery and collecting my prescription from a pharmacy and buying a couple of sausage rolls. And that was the most exciting story I've told in probably a year. So, I know it's supposed to be boring, but it's not supposed to be boring for me. These, these stories I tell, it's, I know, because my, my whole philosophy is What's interesting in that one person is going to be a boring to another person. So I'd rather talk boringly about something that I find interesting than talk boringly about something that I'm bored with. Because we're going to the pharmacy and collecting my prescription, taking Vinny for a walk, uh, ordering food to be delivered and it's the wrong stuff turning up. None of that is of interest to me. You know, I'll talk about it because there's nothing else going on in my life. But it's not interesting. So, I'd rather have something interesting so I can make it boring 
rather than have something boring and make it boringer. Boringer? Is that, is that a word? So, you know, even if I was just travelling around the country, visiting hotels, dog-friendly hotels with Vinny, and just, you know, doing that for a year, or for half the year, it'd be so cool. And I've got a neighbour that would love doing that with me. She'd have her own room, I'd have my room, and Vinny could come with us, and he could decide who he wants to sleep with, it'll be me. And he'd be so happy, because he loves being with his mummy, and he loves being with me as well. He puts up with me, but on bonfire night, he the bonfires, he the fireworks were distressing him so much, he was actually standing at the door he wanted to go and see his mum. I wasn't enough for him. That was quite... I felt quite sad, to be honest. Because he, he, well, I took him over there. She just lives across the road. And he was cuddling up to her and making such a fuss. And I didn't feel enough for him. And it's a shame. Because right now he's cuddled to me and... He's asleep and he's. I'm stroking him and he seems quite happy and content. But the other night he needed more. I wasn't giving him what he needed. And he needs stimulation. He gets so little stimulation from me and that's something that I, I'm a little bit concerned about because I live such a boring life. It's not fair on him. I mean, he's safe and secure and, you know, he's... I don't leave him, hardly ever leave him on his own. But he wants to do things. He wakes me up early hours of the morning sometimes because he wants to play. He's bored. He woke me up this morning literally jumping on me. And I thought he needed to go to the toilet or something. He didn't. He wanted to... We've got this thing where I kick him... Not only kick him, but I push him with my legs when he's on the bed and he kind of jumps over me and I try and catch him between my feet and stuff. He wanted to do that. He wanted to play. He didn't want to eat anything. He wasn't interested in food. He just wanted to play. And... I don't just don't think I'm enough for a little boy. It's going to be even worse for him the next couple of weeks because all I'm going to be doing is sitting at that desk so he won't even be able to cuddle up to me. Because when I'm on the sit, uh, sitting down like this, this is comfortable for him. And he likes this because, you know, I'm continuously stroking him and it's nice for me as well, I like it. And he's so relaxed when he's like this. It took a long time for him to do this, you know. The first year I had him, a whole of that first year, he wouldn't do this at all. He'd always be on the end of the seat near where my legs are. And then bit by bit, he occasionally sort of laid down next to me. And he did it once, and then he'd get up. I'd, every time I went to touch him, he'd get up. And then eventually he kind of allowed me to put my hand down. But don't move my hand. If I move my hand, he'd get up. And then bit by bit, he was doing it more and more often. He'd come and lay down next to me. And now he does it multiple times a day. It's just, it's, it's his normal place to come now. He still likes to lean on the the leg rest and watch television and stuff. But when he's comfortable and he wants to have a sleep, he'll just lay down and I can stroke him continuously. He doesn't jump up or doesn't affect him at all. He just, well, he might enjoy it, I don't know. Just stroking his neck and his shoulders. And he's just lying there, 
relaxed. So it's kind of weird. It's just, uh, yeah, so I, that, that's kind of outside of, I used to be, I used to be very scared of flying, but I, f- I realized the cure of that, the cure of two things, tinnitus, again, I don't know, or not tinnitus, what's the word, uh, where you, you hit your balance has gone. I had that before I got onto a, a long haul flight, cured it, like cured it completely. And I didn't realize that that was possible. I mean, it's a very expensive way to cure something, but bearing in mind how horrible it is to have the, I forget the name of it, the, cause it's a balance thing, isn't it? So I had that for quite a long time. Well, quite a few months, it was like coming and going. And then when I got onto that plane, took off, my ears popped and everything seemed to balance itself out. Also, what I noticed is the, I mean, that could be, you know, those flight simulators do you still get the same pressure from those things? Because that might do the job. So maybe you don't need to actually go up in the air. But that might be, you know, that might be a good way to earn some money for those places. Because I'm pretty sure anyone would be happy to pay a couple of hundred pounds to get rid of that. Whether it's, I don't know if it, if it would work long term. If I had to have been on a plane for 12 hours, that's what did the trick, I don't know to balance everything out and it was a problem really was so but what I noticed is I couldn't be scared of flying for 12 hours solid there's nothing I can do for 12 hours there's nothing I'd want to do for 12 hours but I just couldn't keep it up I couldn't I couldn't keep that level of stress and tension so in the end it had to go because it, it just I couldn't keep it up I didn't have the energy or the willpower to keep it going even though I didn't want it ultimately it, it just I just found it impossible to keep so I don't have an issue of flying anymore at all couldn't care I don't enjoy it. The only thing I don't like about flying is sitting on a a chair, a seat, and the restriction. And with my lower back, it was very painful. But the actual, from, from a fear perspective, has gone completely. I'm still not a fan of heights. But I think part of that was because I only thought about it recently. Is When I lived in Newcastle, I used to get dangled outside. We lived to... I don't know if it was a top floor, but near the top of the block of flats. We used to get dangled outside by our ankles, out of the window. And this person did it to me, did it to my other brother. I don't think he did it to my oldest brother because he was too big. But he did it to my second from oldest and me because he was only two years older than me. So I would have been, I don't know three four years old so he could do it to a six-year-old but an eight-year-old that's too big i think and so yeah i think that probably put me off would definitely put me off being dangled out of a window (laughs) and it, it yeah i think it put me off um heights another thing i never i've never been any good at swimming I can swim technically I've had a lot of swimming lessons when I was a kid I was very lucky actually very fortunate to be at a junior school that had a swimming pool and I did have swimming lessons but it was I had an issue with just the water coming up above my chest anything below my chest I was fine didn't care once the water got that was when I I had anxiety to be... I didn't know what it was called back then, but I did. 
and again I didn't really know why but then well, I did know why actually I did but I kind of I didn't really think about it but the fact is I nearly drowned when I was very young in a swimming pool and there was this fad at the time for these wave machines so I was I don't know if I was in the children's home at the time or if it was before that so I was very little I was maybe six five or six I don't know that kind of age group the fact that I remember it means I must have been I couldn't have been really really young because I well to be fair maybe yeah I don't know I do remember some stuff so I was I always was in the shallow end and I was always at the side so I could hold on to the sides even as an adult I would be even if I went to the deep end I would always swim next to the side I ain't swimming in the middle because I need something to hold on to if I got literally out of my depth so the they turned the, the wave machine on I think they got banned for that exact reason because of there was problems there was a lot of uh, issues with people like me young kids and stuff and but it was a real fad thing it was a big thing but the waves it was really I mean I know a lot of people loved it cause, but I didn't and I got sucked into the middle of the of the pool and I wasn't in the deep end probably at all but I was tiny I didn't have any armbands on or anything otherwise it wouldn't have been a problem would it because I'd have been above the water but I sunk down and I got saved by uh, the lifeguard so uh, yeah water has always been a bit of a it's more for me that's kind of a reason to I've never quite got over the, I've never been good with water since but then I wasn't good with water at the time either so I couldn't swim so I think my mum was it I think my mum chucked me in to the swimming pool and so, what someone apparently someone next to her said oh you're doing that thing where um, she shot me in the deep end so they said you're doing that thing where if you chuck a toddler because I was a baby where you chuck a baby into a swimming pool and they just automatically swim and she said can they so that was a bit weird she didn't realise didn't know about that she was just chucking me in the deep end and but I don't never been a big fan of water I haven't been in the swimming baths I can't actually remember the last time decades decades and decades ago part of the reason for me once I, once I was when I was a kid I wasn't physically bothered about how I looked when I was like a child but once I got to being a, like a young adult I was very self-conscious so having my top off in public would be something that I even now wouldn't do that scares me I wouldn't I wouldn't take my top off because I've either been too skinny or too fat I've never been a couple of times I've been at a good a good kind of body type but you know those days are gone I think it's I've got a, just an older body so even with the muscles it's still it's below par I would say it's below par my dear other things yeah I have dreams of like huge waves tsunamis and things like that so it might be to do with movies I've watched but I'm definitely not a big fan of I love the ocean but I don't like the idea of 
because the ocean's so powerful, just so powerful. And I did see a couple of huge waves when I was young, and that that did frighten me. They were they were freak waves. They wasn't they weren't as big as I remember them because I was tiny, but they were big. They're probably good, like probably forty foot high, thirty or forty foot, and they they went all over, right over to into the road. So I have I have dreams still about that. So it did. Yeah, it's weird, isn't it? So that's that. Anything I'm afraid of. Um, yeah, there's a few things, like personal things, but generally, I think for me, I know we're kind of talking, maybe you were focusing, it's like kind of on spiders, like spiders are not an issue anymore, I used to be, oh man, oh, it, but mice, mice, to be fair, that's probably one of my things had mice in here a couple of years ago and one of the reasons is I think it's because I lived when I lived in one of the places that I lived in when I was little and I don't know why they did this but they used to hang the mouse up near in the toilet or in the bathroom near where the toilet where the, the toilet roll was they just hang them off the wall, like, I don't know why. And also, I used to get told that the meat spread I was eating was made of mice. So, when I got older, I couldn't, I still can't eat meat spread. I know it's not made of mice, you know, I'm 50, I'm over 30 now. But, I still can't, even though logically... It, 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 yeah. Can you imagine being told that? Oh, don't, don't imagine it. Obviously, that's not what this is about, but it was, yeah, it was not good because I was, what, four years old or something? And not only was I seeing this in the bathroom, which was scary anyway, I was then being told that what I was eating was that thing that was hanging, you know, it's like, ugh. And they, the adults, whoever was telling me this, found it hilarious. And I didn't. I didn't know just because they were laughing. I thought they were laughing because I was eating a mouse, not because they were lying to me. Well, the fact is they were lying because I believed what they were saying. That's why they were laughing. I didn't, I didn't know that at the time. They probably didn't mean any harm. They were probably just having fun at my expense. Bless them. So, yeah, because when, when we had mouse, mice in here, I actually chucked out nearly everything from my flat because in my mind everything was contaminated. I chucked away everything, pots and pans, plates, cutlery, you name it. Honestly, I just, I went a little bit, a little bit overboard. Some would say I was perhaps triggered. <laughs> I had an episode. So yeah, that was a few years ago though. My friend downstairs couldn't believe it. He could not believe it. It's like, what the hell? He came up here. Everything was turned upside down. All the stuff I didn't chuck out was upside down. I was living out of my bedroom. And outside the front and in the garden was full of stuff that I chucked out and then he realised that maybe I wasn't that maybe I had a bit of a problem <laughs> possibly I wasn't as emotionally stable as he thought I was and then I thought maybe I could get a bus pass so Cara, thanks for those questions. I probably haven't answered any of your questions, though. By the way, if if it came across that I was being um, 
dismissive of being afraid of spiders. I wasn't, by the way. I'm not dismissive of anyone's fears because everyone's different. And I just, I realised, when I realised that it was caused by someone that ultimately had abandoned me, so I didn't, I didn't feel that I needed to hold on to it anymore because I was no longer, that person was no longer in my life. So why did I need to hold on to their phobias? I mean, they weren't sharing their love with me, so why should why should I share their phobias? That's kind of how I kind of thought, I think. So Kara asks, what are the similarities and what are the differences between Christianity and Buddhism, since you've had experience with both? Mm, mm, mm. Okay, okay. There's different perspectives I can go from this one. This is is this a bit serious, isn't it? This this podcast. But I hope it's not too serious. But you know, I have made a lot of really silly podcasts over the years. So the occasional semi did I just say semi serious ones are going to happen occasionally. Um, I the difference between Christianity and Buddhism. I want to go from my perspective, okay, my own perspective. So Christianity, Jesus, Buddhism, Buddha. Uh, the similarities, you could say, they both went around, gained a following by preaching to people or talking to people, giving sermons or giving talks. The Buddha did it and had followers. And Jesus did it and had followers. The Buddha, Jesus was talking from a perspective of being the son of God. And he'd learnt... I mean, he was a Jew, so he was, he'd learned from Judaism, hadn't he? And the Old Testament, as far as I understand. So, uh, with the Buddha, the Buddha was brought up a Hindu. So, there's a, there's a difference, actually, because, so with Jesus, he, he carried on what he'd learned, but in a, from a different perspective I would I would argue and it was less vengeful more it seemed more kinder not than a Buddha but more kinder than some of the Old Testament because I did read the Old Testament when I was a kid I read the New Testament a few times and I can't quote script and you know how people do, like, um, Luke 54, 12, or whatever, you know, they just, like, quote these things. I don't do that. I've never been able to do that. I never will do that. Um, with Buddhism, they have a thing called the Pali Canon, which is the scriptures of the Buddha. But it's not just the Buddhist teachings it's also the Buddhist disciples teachings and the Buddhist disciples disciples teachings and it's huge the Christianity has from my perspective it's just the New Testament because it, for me Christianity is it's named after Jesus So, therefore, it's about what Jesus said, not about what was said before Jesus. Even though he was expanding on stuff that had already been said. So, I think, personally, I would say...
I loved I loved some of the stuff that Jesus said but it's worth remembering that people weren't writing it down when he was talking and they weren't writing down when the Buddha was talking it was a long time before anyone wrote anything down this stuff was passed word word of mouth passed down during the generations through the generations word of mouth and if I know anything about word of mouth is stories change the original story will not stay the same no matter how much they try and keep it that way it will change so no one living today knows exactly what happened no one knows exactly what was said um, it's it's a weird one it's a hard one I mean let me see I, I, I don't want to make sure that I'm not being completely wrong with what I'm saying here so when okay let me see how should I word this Right. When was oh that's weird. Why is it taken off the the microphone? When was blind okay? Wow. Right, so when was the New Testament written? The New Testament was written so let's say 50 AD between 50 AD and 100 AD it spanned several decades after the life of Jesus with different authors contributing books um, so yeah several decades with the Buddha I think it might have been more even more than that so if you tell someone a story, maybe in January, by December, if that story is passed through, the story will change, very likely change. And that's just in one year. Can you imagine decades, how the story will change? And not everybody's truthful. how many people added a few things you know so it's it's not I'm not really a big uh, a big taking everything literally kind of person because I like the ideas and I mean as far as the greatest story ever told it it, it, it arguably is one of the greatest stories ever told so I did I like I like but then the Buddha you know how it started with him is he was they say he was a prince but in them days he was just he was originally he was grown up in a nice place sheltered from life from the harshness of life in India so I know some people might think, well, the Buddha's Chinese. I've seen a, I've seen a statue of him. He's a big fat Chinese man. No, that was not the Buddha. But the Buddha was always laughing in his big Chinese, laughing. No, that was not the Buddha. The Buddha was Indian, born in India. It was taken to China by uh, a different, from an Indian um, Buddhist. A lot longer, long, a long time after the Buddha. So, Bodhisattva, Bodhisattva, I think his name is, he took it to China from India. So, the Buddha, the, here's the story, here's the story is, he had a sheltered life and he went out one day, got taken out on a horse and cart, or in a Rolls Royce, I don't know, whatever it is. And he saw things that he'd never seen before. And he was asking the 
coach driver what it was he was looking at and what he saw people that were ill he saw people that were dead he saw people that were like he just saw different stages of basically just people at different stages of life and he realised that first of all there's n- there's no, no such thing as impermanence because we're always changing we're always getting older nothing stays the same and he wanted to stay the same because he was healthy and young and he, f- he didn't realise one day he was going to get old and pass away he didn't, didn't know that because he'd been sheltered from all that stuff so it seemed to spark something in his head And he basically left, left the life he had and went and became a a nomad, like walking without anything, no belongings, begging for food. And I think he was just looking for spiritual guidance because he, he would have been probably a Hindu. That would have been his religion at that time he would have been brought up to be a Hindu I think and so he travelled around India and he listened to lots of different spiritual teachers and gurus and stuff like that and then he didn't really find what he was looking for so he decided to sit under um, a tree a buddhi tree or whatever it's called but he decided to sit under a tree until he reached an understanding which was I guess enlightenment but that's just he, he wanted to reach an understanding which that he was looking for and he couldn't find it anywhere in reality and it's an argument but in reality he was probably hugely influenced by all the different people that he met all the different gurus, all the different religions, all the different spiritual practices. And by sitting under the tree, the Bodhi tree, for however many days and nights he sat under there. So there's that comparison between that and Jesus being in the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. And he said, I'm not going to move until I gain understanding which kind of enlightenment and he did and it just clicked something clicked and so I'm thinking Jesus was hugely influenced by his the religion he was grown up to believe in the Buddha would have been hugely influenced by his religion he was brought up in And then he would have kind of used, he would have, that would have been part of what he then became and what he learned. So it wasn't a case we just suddenly had a new religion. Nor was it a case that Jesus suddenly had a new religion. It was like an extension. It was like seeing things from a different angle, from a different perspective. So yeah, so the Buddha apparently became enlightened and he started teaching people and I don't think he wanted to I think uh, if I remember rightly he wanted to just go and live in a desert but people like asked him please begged him to teach us how can we be like you and he'd say to them you're never going to be like me <laughs> I'm better than all of you. He didn't say that. And he had disciples just like Jesus did. And they got enlightened. Just like Jesus' uh, disciples had powers and kind of got enlightened in, in a kind of Christian way. So there was kind of similarities from that perspective. Very different, but kind of similar. They're both male they both were surrounded by men. It was 
predominantly a male thing back then. It's society and religion dominated by men in them days. So, yeah, it was... I find Buddhism goes deeper. It's not reliant upon faith. It's reliant, it's a practical, it's more practical, I find. Um, but there's so many crossovers. I mean, there's practices with Buddhism where you actually imagine he's with you. And if you imagine that the Buddha's with you, this person that is going to protect you, that's no different from imagining Jesus with you. And who would you, you would feel, how could you not feel safe with Jesus by your side? How could you not feel safe with the Buddha by your side? Or you could just argue, how could you not feel safe with your loving parent by your side when you're, it's like being a small baby and having your mother with you, if your mother's, you know, a decent person, you're going to feel safe having your parents. So it's kind of like an extension to having safe parents, I suppose. It's kind of reverting back to being a baby again, putting all your trust, because when you're a baby, you have to, or a toddler or a young child, you put everything in the trust of the hands of those adults that are caring for you. You've got no choice. They feed you, they pick you up if you can't walk, or whatever, you know, at the points. So it's just like, they do everything for you. So you have to put trust and have faith in them. You've got no choice. But with, I think with Jesus and with the Buddha and I guess also other religions, if you're not indoctrinated into it from birth, you have a choice. So it's almost, in Buddhism, they call it going for refuge. In uh, Christianity, is giving yourself up to Jesus, accepting Jesus into your life, into your heart, putting your trust in Jesus. In Buddhism, it's going for refuge to the three jewels, which is basically, if you look at it literally, going for refuge, a refugee. Taking, going to refuge, basically being protected from everything. A refugee, that's why I, I'm not a big fan of how the refugees are treated in this country. Because the word refugee, it means that it's our job as humans to care and to protect people. All, all of us, each other. And we're all refugees in, a, in certain aspects of our lives. There's been times in my life, I've lived in this country, apart from when I went to Ireland, I've lived in this country my whole life, and I felt like a refugee at times, in a sense of needing somewhere safe to be, emotionally. Somewhere where I could just, a few times in the past, somewhere where I could be and I was safe, I didn't have to think about money, finances, debts, food, anything. Everything was provided for me. And I've needed that a few times. And I think everybody needs that sometimes. Whether it's material or emotional. Or it could be very, so many different variations of the same thing. So we're all, I think we've all been refugees at times in our life. Not in the same way as a refugee coming from a war-torn country. I'm not comparing anyone's issues. Everyone's got their own issues. Everyone, you know, things are different for different people. I'm not comparing it. But I'm just going through, from a Buddhist perspective, going for refuge is putting your trust in three jewels, which is the Dharma, which is the teachings of the Buddha, the Buddha, the Buddha, the Sangha, which is the collective of Buddhists or Buddhist followers, followers of the Buddha, Buddha, who 
also go for refuge. So they go to refuge to each other, supporting each other. They go to refuge to the Buddha and to the words of the Buddha, the writings, you know, the teachings. So it's very similar really to Buddha's, uh, to Christianity in a sense of giving, giving yourself. I mean, if you said go to refuge to Jesus, it might first of all be a bit, oh, what do you mean to like going for refuge or not a refugee? But then when you look at it from that perspective, looking for safety, looking for protection, then a lot of Christians would understand that. Like, yeah, I look to Jesus for protection and for safety, emotionally maybe, maybe not physically, but emotionally. And yeah, it's not something you can touch. And the Sangha, which would be in Buddhism, the followers of Buddhism, it just be Christian followers, pick other Christians. They've got a Sangha, they just don't call it a Sangha. Maybe they just call it a church. And you've got the Dharma, the teachings of the Buddha. You've got the Bible, or the New Testament, the teachings of Jesus. And then you've got all the thousands of books that have come out of that, that people have written about the teachings and different ways to view the teachings. Because sometimes that's what's needed. Uh, I found that with uh, hypnosis. By reading lots and lots and lots of different books. I got a chance to understand. The same topic from different angles. And sometimes I needed that. You know I could read the same thing ten times and then. It will click because it's given to me in a different way that fits together with some of the other stuff. Or maybe I'm just really slow. It could be that as well. So yeah, there's a few there's a few differences, similarities. I don't know. I know a little bit about other religions, but I don't know a lot. I don't know a lot about anything really, but as far as religions go, Buddhism and Christianity... Although I used to be a Catholic when I was in a children's home, so I mean that's a different ball game altogether. That's not really about Jesus. It's about it's the Old Testament, isn't it? It's more about um, I don't remember exactly, but it's very it's yeah it's a lot stricter, and it didn't seem so gentle. For me, I never understood how a Christian could be anything other than gentle and loving and kind. From a, from a Christian perspective, obviously as a human being, everyone's got the ability to be both, haven't they? But from a in in the kind of Christian mode, it would just be kindness, kindness, nothing but kindness. So I never really got my head around some of the extremism that I've seen over the years so and I've never been really into extremism in any in any shape or form extremist or yeah just not really been into that stuff whether it's Buddhism whether it just like people have different needs and things are different in different countries have got different ways and yeah I just never been a big fan of the whole extremist ideology from any perspective whether it's from a religious perspective or from a, a scientific perspective or even if it's from a ecological environmental perspective yeah, baby. Yeah, baby, baby. Right, I got five minutes to make myself something to eat before I watch Big Brother. So I make myself a cup of tea, make a sandwich, which will take me probably five minutes. And that's the end of this recording. And I'll talk to you again in a month. 
So uh, it would be probably the 1st of December. But in reality... Um, just going to watch... I'm just going to watch at 10... I um yeah that's the end of this recording so I just, I just replied to a text message so I've got a friend who's watching Big Brother and she's got a tendency of spoiling it for me because I watch it too late so you know I didn't watch it till Saturday morning the when they kick people out the eviction and she already told me like who are you going to choose and gave me the list of people I didn't even know who was up for eviction so I need to not look at my phone and it's on at 9 but they show it again at 10 like the ITV plus ITV 2 plus 1 so I watch it from 10 till I don't know 11.30 and then I'll go to bed. I really am going to go to bed. I really will. After I've taken Vinny for a wee wee. So thank you for listening. Remember, remember, remember to be kind to yourself. Because you do deserve to be happy. And be gentle with yourself. And I will speak to you in December. Da, da, da. Bye. Relax. In a more deep and meaningful way. Maybe in a way that can not just allow you to feel calmer now and throughout the time we spend together here not just relaxed at the end of the recording when it's finished and you can enjoy that sense of comfort and peace but also I think it would be nice to have those feelings of relaxation continue for longer after the recording is ended. So that you can still benefit from listening to my voice maybe in a few hours time perhaps tomorrow and then by listening regularly especially if you find like some people do, and myself as well. I Sometimes I'll find one particular recording that really resonates with me. And I'll just listen to it over and over again. Like every morning, every evening. There was this recording from, we're going back to about 1999. It, was a, it wasn't hypnosis, but it was a guided visualisation. So it kind of was hypnosis, really. And I managed to find it again. And it still has the same effect on me. And part of it was... person's voice 
relaxed me. Just felt so peaceful. And I'd look forward to listening to her in the morning and in the evening. And I knew before even pressing the play button that as soon as I'd done that, pressed the play button, this was in the days of CD players. Press the play button. In fact, it might have even been a tape, a tape recorder. I'd lie down on the bed and then even without necessarily listening to her words because I had them memorized really. It was as if my body knew exactly what to do. And the muscles just almost went into automatic relaxation. And I remember my mind would slow down. Now, now, I was, I was listening to this recording in the early days of learning hypnosis. And long before I ever made any videos or audio recordings myself because I didn't start doing that till 2006 but I knew I knew how helpful I found being able to just let go, to have that trust in the person that I'm listening to. Knowing that it's going to be just as relaxing, if, if not more so, each time you hear my voice, you may feel the same. Some people have been listening to me for over a decade. Maybe not solidly, obviously not 24 hours a day, but maybe people come back. Some people maybe listen every day. And something that I do which you may not realize by listening is when I record these recordings now for example I also am affected by the words that I say. The 
So if I said to you, focus on your feet, notice your feet relaxing. I will be focusing on my feet. I will be noticing my feet relaxing. And if I said focus on your hands, and maybe notice the difference between each hand. Perhaps notice the, the air in the room, the temperature of the room on the backs of your hands. You may start to notice it almost feels like a very light breeze, even though there may not be any type of breeze at all where you are right now. And as you become aware of your hands. I'm also aware of how relaxed my hands are feeling now. comes to potentially drifting off to sleep, which may be the reason you're listening. I also feel drowsy when I make these recordings. I also notice my mind drifting. In fact, at times, I've actually fallen asleep. Without even noticing. And then I carry on talking. It's only when I listen back to do the editing. I hear snoring. And I think, I don't remember snoring. I remember talking. Is snoring or is a pig turned up? That's what I sound like when I snore. And I get really into the whole experience. I don't know how you feel. How relaxed you feel in your feet. How relaxed you feel in your hands. I have noticed more and more
that the more relaxed, the deeper, level of comfort you feel, the easier your breathing becomes. It's almost like that additional muscle relaxation This allows you to breathe easier. Without necessarily focusing on your breath. However, being able to notice the ease in which You breathe so naturally. You breathe so very easily and smoothly. Whenever I imagine my breathing improving, when I've got my eyes closed, I tend to Visualize a beautiful field with trees and flowers. Producing all that life-giving oxygen. Feels nice. To, if nothing else, just taking some time away from everything. Enjoying that feeling of peace, serenity. a joyful heart it 
time seems to just drip by so very slowly. So deeply peaceful. Completely unattached to any thoughts whatsoever in this moment. Completely free. Noticing that your mind has slowed down slowed down. Because nothing really requires your attention. You can enjoy physical sensations of allowing the stress to drip out of your body. Drip in out of every part of your body. And being released from your brain and your mind. Slowly, but surely, the muscles in your legs Relax. Relax. 
Pleasant feelings in your arms and shoulders. Deepening each part of your body. Further and deeper and deeper. In the feelings in the back of your neck, the feelings in your wrists Muscles in the front of your body, are also feeling. deeply there's a sense of peace spreads through your very core Focus on your mind. The mind becomes even slower.
deeper. Relaxing. Very slow. Your stomach. in your stomach your back Notice how relaxed you now feel. spine, from your brain all the way down the middle of your back, sending and receiving millions of messages every day. Deeply relaxed. Spreading those signals down your spinal cord into every part of your body. Your 
shins and your calf muscles. Feelings of peace and tranquility spreading through your body, tips of your toes to your eyes, your fingers. all the way to your lower back. And letting go. Really letting go. Just wandering away. Happy to let go. Let go. Completely. Let go. So tranquil, your whole body. Joy in a sense of letting go. Even more
Joy. The space. This space. Of peace. And safety. Letting go. Maybe we can just focus on the different parts of your body. Just to notice forehead and your eyes. Seeing a sense of 
complete freedom. Absolute freedom. Peaceful energy. have noticed your mind drifting Peaceful. Blissful peace. Blissful peace.
total peace. Letting go. body body feels almost invisible. you could start to notice that you are feeling more relaxed even though I've not purposely focused your mind upon that sense of physical comfort that is growing within you throughout your body and your mind starts to slow down and that could be almost in recognition of I guess my speech not being particularly fast and 
things just generally feel calmer just by listening to my voice. You give yourself a, an opportunity to take a break from the day. Take a break from your life as it is. And to give yourself a rest. Giving yourself permission to take some time off. And to allow your body to relax. And allow your mind to slow down. Which in turn releases the tension, any stresses that you had in your body. It's almost as if the parts of your body just open up, allowing the negativity out. And at the same time, replacing that negativity with positive, healing energy. Which then fills your body up and your mind to also starts to appreciate those feelings of increasing confidence and an almost uplifting feeling positive healing an energy that spreads through your body like a wave of comfort And all this comes from just allowing yourself a few minutes, maybe half an hour, however long you want it to be, to just rest. And allow your mind and your body to almost reset itself to the, to the settings of comfort and relaxation, calmness, which allows more room for feelings of pleasure and happiness to move around your body and into your mind almost as if your mind and your body are sinking together almost mirroring each other with that growing positivity and calmness and it feels nice it really does feel nice to know that you are the one that has allowed yourself to feel more comfort to experience more of this deep relaxation spreading throughout your body. And as I focus on each part of your body, 
you can notice that that part becomes even more relaxed just by focusing on it becomes even more calm and comfortable just by focusing and as I move down your body starting at your head the parts that you've already focused on will continue to relax deeply and those parts that we've not yet focused on will just automatically release any remaining tension in anticipation of even more comfort about to come now I'm going to start by focusing on your forehead just being aware of the feelings of your forehead and any background sounds like Mr. Herbert the Pigeon can just allow you to feel even more relaxed just means you're in the moment this isn't this isn't a sterile environment this is the world I live in the countryside so there's lots of nature sounds around As you focus on your forehead, just notice how it becomes even more relaxed as you focus only on my voice and that part of your body. Moving down to your eyes. Focusing on your eyes, noticing how the, your eyelids feel so heavy, yet so light at the same time. And all the muscles around your eyes relaxing completely. Moving your focus down to your mouth, your lips, your tongue, your teeth and your gums, and the whole of your mouth relaxing, calm and loose as you focus now on your jaw, not just the part of your jaw near your mouth, your chin, but all the way up the sides of your face to your ears, that whole of your jaw, feeling more in on your neck, the front of your neck and your throat, relaxing and loose and calm, the sides of your neck, the right and left side of your neck. Focus.
focusing on the back of your neck. Letting go of any tension that may have been there before and enjoying that sense of increasing comfort and release that you can experience in the back of your neck. Moving down your back, moving either side of your spine, right from the top of your back, all the way down to the bottom of your back. Down to your lower back. As you move up and down your spine, you can feel the muscles either side of your spine relaxing even more. And as those muscles relax, that sense of comfort starts to spread outwards from your spine into both sides of your back. The top of your back, the middle and your lower back. And as you scan gently and slowly up and down your back as the muscles in the top of your back relax and become looser. The muscles in the middle of your back also seem to just almost divide from each other, separating and almost melting. And in your lower back, there seems to be an extra special feeling of comfort. This spreads into your hips down your lower back and into your hips, into the area where your coccyx are, and into your buttocks, and all those muscles that spread in your lower back, into your hip area. Start to melt. Start to really let go. And you know we're about to focus on your shoulders, your back and your spine will continue to let go, continue to relax, so calmly, and as you focus on your shoulders, you may notice that they're already feeling
these muscles that move from your neck into your shoulders. so soft and gentle, so smooth, and calm, and the feeling shoulders seems to spread deep into your shoulders that sense of relaxation not just traveling deeply into your muscles but also relaxing bones, and moving all the way to underneath your arms, relaxing that whole area between the tops of your shoulders and underneath your arms, healing. so relaxed and comfortable in your shoulders, which sends that deep healing message into your You may feel almost as if your arms are not even there because they're so relaxed, so deeply relaxed. So. spreading all the way down your arms to your elbows, including your elbows, circumference spread forearms and your wrists, feeling so heavy, yet at the same time, so light and gentle. Focusing now on 
sense of real peace. It just seems to feel so familiar. tips attention to the front of your body, so comfortable, muscles in your thighs your knees
muscles and your shins So I'm going to start counting down now from 20 down to 1. You can imagine in a way it's like just walking down some steps. And each step, all 20 steps, and each step represents a level of comfort. Each step repre 
sense a deepening of that comfort. And the further you, you walk down those steps, the deeper and more relaxed you feel. So, starting with number 20. Eighteen. Seventeen.
body. Thirteen.
hate. Six.
As you focus on your eyes, I'm going to count down from ten down to one. Focus in just on your eyes, your eyelids, the 
muscles around your eyes, your eyeballs themselves, the whole area that makes up your eye. As we count down from ten down to one, whilst focusing on your eyes, you will become twice as relaxed with each number counting down. you may find that all you want to do is just drift off to sleep and if that's what you want then just allow yourself to do that in on your eyes, I'm going to begin counting down from ten down to one, right now, ten.
So counting down from ten to one, ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four. Three, two, one. And maybe that was a bit too quick in order to relax. Maybe it's a bit too fast for you to notice the calming of your body. Maybe even a little bit of pressure there like 
You're counting down from 10 to 1. What do you expect me to do, man? You expect me just to go all floppy? Just because you're counting down? I could try it again. But this time, I'll go a bit slower. This time, and you focus on the whole of your body before we focus on your legs. Just notice how your body does start to feel more relaxed. With every number that I count down. Ten. Seven, six, five, four. just notice how how you feel generally how your body feels it's not necessarily even about counting down from 10 to 1 it's that space that you have that space between being active physically or mentally to just sitting or lying down just being there not doing anything not saying anything not needing to think think about anything so it, op it opens up a space you know a bit of a space a gap and the more I count down from 10 to 1 the bigger that gap becomes so there's that gap of calmness of comfort, of relaxation. It's a nice feeling. And it moves those stresses or discomforts physically or emotionally, moves them away. Allows you to just slow down. So I'm going to count again from 10 down to 1. And notice that gap widening. The gap. And 
as it widens, it's almost like the the stress and attention falls into the gap. It gives you that distance, that space. Seven, six, How does your body feel now? Can you notice that that you're feeling calmer? Feeling more relaxed. As we now focus on the legs. Just your legs. We're just going to start with focusing on your thighs. course it's not the most exciting thing to be doing because I'm I'm sure like most of your body there's not a lot going on right now just focusing on the whole of your thighs the tops of your thighs the sides of your thighs, the bottoms of your thighs, your outer thighs and your inner thighs. Basically the whole of your thigh that leads into your hip. 
and then goes down to your knee joints. Now this is a big area. It's a very heavy area. It's very strong. Probably the strongest muscles in your body are in your thighs. But I don't think we perhaps give enough attention to our thighs. Perhaps we don't acknowledge how important our thighs are to our lives. How much they actually do for us all through our lives. It may seem or sound really weird, but I think that all of our body parts, especially our thighs, need some TLC. A bit of love shown. A bit of acknowledgement. A thank you. Gratitude for what our thighs do for us. And I know this may sound a bit strange. Maybe you think, why am I? Surely I should be out in, in the garden hugging a tree or something. Or it's hard to set a microphone up on a tree. That's why I'm doing this indoors. Otherwise I would be outside hugging a tree. No, I can't see the television from the tree. You move down to your knees, gain such an important part. And I think we don't necessarily, I'll speak for myself here, I don't necessarily appreciate all that my knees do for me until I have a problem with my knee. So occasionally, if I have a Maybe I bash it or it's aching for some reason. It's then that I realise how much it does. You know, the benefit of being able to use my legs without any kind of physical discomfort is a beautiful thing. That's possibly not appreciated until... It's temporarily removed, you know, that comfort. But as you focus on your knees, regardless of how your knees feel, you can have that sense of gratitude and love to your knees for all that they do for you. And you can still have that attention on your thighs. Maybe notice how your thighs feel. Maybe you can notice that they are relaxing more deeply. As you focus now, on the bottoms of your legs, 
the shins and the calf muscles and the bones between your knees and your feet. Incorporating, of course, your ankles. So important. And anyone that's had even the, like the slightest sprain of an ankle knows how how much we take our ankles for granted. And it's kind of strange in a way when you think that you know, logically our wrists are a lot thinner than the rest of our arms, which is okay, doesn't can't see any problem with that because we're just picking stuff up. But our ankles are so much thinner than the rest of our legs. And from a physics perspective, or logical even, it doesn't really make sense that all this weight would ultimately be resting on your ankles, then leading to your feet. That thin area, thin bone. Yeah, it does so much great work. Supports us, supports our body for a lifetime. Helps us to balance. Helps you to get around and be mobile. the calf muscles of course when I was younger I couldn't see the point in calf muscles they didn't seem to do anything I was okay if I walked around on tiptoes then my calf muscles get some work but of course that's not true the calf muscles are being used whenever we use our legs your shins there to protect your lower legs shaped in a way almost as a protector for the bone leading of course to your ankles your feet but we're not going to focus on your feet we're just going to focus on the legs and I realize that now that I've mentioned your feet you're probably focusing on them anyway so maybe I should focus on your feet a little bit you can have them in your awareness the same as you have your thighs in your awareness, even though we haven't been focusing on your thighs for a few minutes. We've been focusing on your ankles. There's still that sensation of comfort in your thighs. It's that movement of energy because the thighs hold lots of different sensations. Of course, there's the muscles, the big, strong muscles that we have in our thighs. But the skin on the outside of the thighs as in the outside of all of our body can be very sensitive 
sensitive to the touch, sensitive to temperature. And inside your thighs, the bones, there's the muscle, there's the blood vessels, the arteries. So all this stuff is inside your thighs. And I guess sometimes it'd be nice if you could actually put your fingers inside your thighs and massage. So you can massage on the outside, of course, but to be able to get deep into the muscles, to be able to just massage inside your thighs, massage in the bones of your leg, massage in all the veins and just gently healing your thighs. could move down, massaging inside your knees, it's massaging those bones, but with healing fingertips, spreading that healing energy deep into the joints of your knees, and of course there's the back of your your knee, you know, the inside crease where your knee is. It's a very sensitive area. Very, feels very nice when you stroke it. That might be because it's an area that's not really touched very often. It's almost like a hidden part, that crease in your legs. It's almost like a part that has a, a sensitivity which is a little bit different. Of course it's protected by your legs. So you can imagine putting your fingers into that crease in your legs. fold in between your legs, you can just massage with your fingertips, imagine your fingertips going inside, massaging the muscle tissue, you can of course feel the, the bones of your knees healing through your fingertips. And then as you go down to your calf muscles, now that's a part I'd like to be able to really put my fingertips deep inside my calf muscles, massaging every single tissue of that muscle, healing every part. The same for my shins, just massaging and gently stroking the bones, gently stroking them, healing in a loving way because they deserve to be treated as the precious bones that they are. Because our legs are so precious, as in all the other parts of our body. They're more precious than any jewel on the planet. Now when you start to think about your legs in this way, it can change your perspective. Might sound a bit, a bit silly to start with, 
the idea of having the love for your legs, showing appreciation for your thighs, wanting to be able to put your hands in your thighs, and massage the muscles in the bones, and to get your fingers deep in there, releasing all tension, just to show how much you care about your legs, how much you care for what your legs do for you regularly, your knees, your calves, your ankles. The strength of your ankles, considering how thin they are compared to the rest of your legs, especially your thighs, yet they're so strong, so flexible, absolutely amazing things your ankles are. Truly a gift because of what they do for you. Supporting all that weight, regardless of how what weight you are, even if you're only eight stone, it's still a lot of weight in these little ankles. stone, double that, yet my ankles support my body all the time, although they do give off a sigh of relief when I sit down, as in fact my whole legs do, my feet, feet also go toes clap, I'm so happy, the legs really are amazing. And I know that talk, uh, talking about your legs is probably possibly the, one of the most in, most boring things you've ever heard anyone say, possibly. But boring or not, everything I said is true. Your legs are amazing. Your legs deserve not just respect, they deserve to relax deeply. They deserve to take some time out of the day to just let go completely. Because the legs are so, such a most, you know, very important part of your body, when you relax your legs, the rest of your body also naturally follows in that 
journey of comfort. I can feel it in my hips. My hips feel really loose. And also in my lower back as well. My lower back really feels, it feels stretched. Even though I'm just sitting in a chair and there's no stretching as far as I'm aware that I'm doing. But it's almost as if the muscles have just relaxed so much that there is a natural stretch as the tension has reduced a lot. Continue to feel wonderfully relaxed. Ten, nine, eight, seven. So I'm just going to count down from five down to one. And as I count down, if you just focus on the numbers, just the numbers, counting down, and notice how you feel in this moment as you hear the numbers counting down, knowing that those numbers counting down represents you feeling calmer, not just in your body, but also relaxing your mind. And just notice how you feel. There's nothing to do. There's nothing to say. There's nothing to think about. Starting with number five. Four. Three. One. As you notice the gradual letting go of the tension in your body. You may also begin to notice and be aware of how your mind is starting to slow down. This is just a natural thing that happens. It's not really a special procedure. It's just natural because as you're body relaxes, your mind also starts to relax. And the more 
your mind relaxes, the more your body relaxes. It's just a continuous circle of relaxation. And there's that calmness that comes from relative quietness. You know, even even if there's background sounds, either your side or mine, is still going to be quite calm. You know, you haven't got the television on, there's no music in the background unless you're listening to the recording with music, of course. You're very likely not going to be sitting in a room with other people. Of course you might be, but generally it's more ideal if you can do this on your own. So, no distractions. And when you stop thinking about stuff, relaxation automatically rises. A sense of comfort starts to grow. And without trying to build it up into something fantastical or something magical, this is just a natural process, something that's easy to accomplish. In fact, it's almost you know, the sense of relaxing completely happens really when you put no effort into it. It's not something that you can really force. It's something that happens naturally and part of the process of this recording and others is simply to allow you to take advantage of this space, this time, to just let go, to just be here, to be in tune with how you feel. Yet with the intention of wanting to relax deeply. You know, maybe even to fall asleep depending on what it is that you wish for yourself in this moment. As we know, relaxing is the majority of the process of falling asleep. The actual falling asleep part is a tiny bit at the end. The deeper relaxed you become, the easier you find yourself drifting. You can also, if you choose, stay focused on my voice and really enjoy the process of gradually Relaxing each moment.
ますわ。In your body. Effortlessly. And just observing. Sensation of letting go. Notice your mind calming down more with each number you hear me say. Naturally feeling calm and slow and peaceful. Slowed right down, sinking deeply into relaxation. As you focus on your mind, you may notice that 
there are some thoughts still there, maybe some stubborn thoughts that for some reason perhaps need your attention. thoughts, sprinkle those thoughts with love, like little petals from a flower, just sprinkle it over them, petals filled with love towards those thoughts, to let those thoughts know that you're not abandoning them, you just need them, you require them to just calm down, slow down, quiet down. As you focus on those remaining thoughts, as we count down this time from seven down to one, with each number, just imagine sprinkling those flower petals of love, kindness, gratitude. Over those thoughts. Which will allow them to just. Melt away. And relax deeply. With every number. Those thoughts will become more. with number seven.
changing now. Notice how relaxed you're feeling in your body. We're going to focus the more relaxed your hands are, the more relaxed your body and mind are. And as you focus on your hands and your fingers, nothing needed to be done, there's no clenching of fists or tensing the fingers or anything like that, it's just noticing and focusing on your Noticing how they feel. Because the more relaxed your hands feel, the calmer your Noticed your mind is starting to drift. Just on your hands and fingers, allowing them to experience a real deepening of that relaxation in your hands and fingers. number from eight down to one you can almost feel that healing and relaxing energy spreading into your hands Each 
Seven. Just being here now. Nothing to think about. Nothing to do. Nothing to say. Everything just feels calmer. This is your natural state of being. This is how you just normally feel when you take away all that other stuff that we add. You know, things like stress and worry and overthinking and anxiety. Stuff. And we 
take that away, which is what we do, what we're doing now. We're left with a real sense of peacefulness, which comes through very quickly. Because ultimately, it's just a feeling. A feeling of comfort. It's almost as if we've gone inside yourself and we've found a special place where everything is peaceful. place where you can feel relaxed and your natural sense of comfort. A place where you can be you. Where you can accept yourself for who you are. A place where you're not trying to anybody else ever a place where you can actually not just love yourself but in some ways more importantly you can like yourself appreciate who you are sense of gratitude is in the air all around you. And that's also a place where you can actually feel the healing energy soaking into your body. soaking into your body and that healing energy spreads through your veins traveling to each and every single part of your body start to realize that actually that healing energy has not just entered into your brain, it's become part of your brain. And that spinal fluid is now mixed with healing energy. Not just allowing you to feel so much more relaxed and healthy in this moment, but also you start to realize that actually what's happening now with that healing relaxing energy spreading through your body is actually changing your life it's actually changing the way you're going to feel not just now but tomorrow and the next day as your health improves Not just your physical health, but your mental health. Things that used to bother you in the past, for some reason, no longer 
have the effect that they used to. Because something has changed deep within you. Maybe things that used to cause you to feel anger no longer have that power to control you the way they seem to be able to before because you realize that you are the one who decides what affects you. You're the one who decides to feel relaxed and calm when you choose to enjoy Noticing these natural developments of healing continuing to grow and improve your life day by day. Including, of course, your ability to relax so much easier and sleep in is the most natural thing in the world to you because falling asleep is something that you've done You know that you were born, as we all were, with the ability to fall asleep naturally. You were born with that ability to just drift off into a deep, healing sleep. Even when we're kids, sometimes we'll fall asleep when we don't even want to. We try to <laughs> stay awake. Maybe it's a birthday in the morning or it's Christmas or holiday or something we look forward to. We don't want to go to sleep. But the more we want to stay awake, the more we just start to drift. the more you fight drifting, the more you try and stop yourself from drifting asleep, the deeper and stronger that drifting becomes. Because we're born not just with the need to relax deeply and to naturally fall asleep. It's our birthright. It's part of our DNA. And sometimes as we get older in life, perhaps at times we have forgotten that relaxing completely it's not only a wonderfully pleasant experience, it's also really easy. It's very, very easy. 
permission to let go because that's all it is is just deciding Press the play button on my recordings. You have given permission for my voice to relax you. When you press that play button, you have given me permission for my words. Positive, only a positive way, opening up your mind to useful and healing suggestions. effect on how you feel right now as well as those changes that continue long after the recording ends those changes within Continue to flourish and grow, transforming your life in a positive, beautiful way, allowing you to move forward in your life in the direction that you choose for yourself. And this feeling, this feeling that you can experience of safety, comfort, calmness, This feels so nice. It's such a healthy place to be. And that positivity grows within you. physically and in your mind is more relaxed and it's not that you're thinking slower it's just that your mind will be less clogged up with unnecessary negativity Because from now on, your mind rejects negativity. From now on, you're going to start noticing when negativity arises. You can just say stop. Stop. Negativity will turn around and leave you alone. Stop. And that negativity.
activity would disappear. As you notice that you feel way more relaxed than you probably expected. You can now congratulate yourself because you're the person that has done this. You are the one that has opened your mind up to the simple facts that you can feel more relaxed in your body and in your mind. You've opened your mind up to the birthright of being able to just Fall asleep easily when you choose. And that's a nice feeling, don't you think? Feels nice, doesn't it? To feel spreading through your body and your mind. To spend time in that, that special place where negativity can no longer enter. Negativity is banned, it's barred, it's not allowed entry, doesn't, it doesn't, des doesn't deserve to be here, doesn't belong here, negativity has no place in your life. room for more comfort, more healing, more relaxation, more peace. doesn't it, to just to let go of everything, and I'm going to count down now from 20 down to 1. Continue to relax. And if you choose, you can drift to sleep. With every number, you hear me say, you can feel twice as relaxed. Or if you choose, you can feel twice as sleepy. And now, twenty.
is your time to just take a break. Your time to relax, to allow your mind to slow down. Give yourself permission to take a break from everything and you're the only person that can make that decision. You're the only person that can actually tell your mind Just relax. To just take some time off. So that you can focus on your body getting in touch with you feel physically and in the process of this body scan where you focus on different parts of your body those on and observe, even though you're not purposely requesting for those parts of your body to relax, it's kind of expected. You expect when you listen to my voice to feel more relaxed, naturally. Because when you're listening to me, your attention is focused on my words. And as my words guide you to focus on those parts of your body. focus increases which actually calms your mind and when your mind calms down body relaxes. And when your body calms down, your mind relaxes. started to focus on your body, you can already feel that healing energy spreading through your body, pushing out stress and tension. of your body, including your skin, your bones, your blood, and all of your organs inside your body, all of them my 
versus rule of effect on every area of your head and your body is filled with that healing energy. And when you blame feels relaxation increases deeply increases in a way that your mind starts feel perhaps a bit drowsy because it's not needed and your mind starts to drift what's needed. So if you're listening to this and what you need is deep relaxation, that's what you'll get. If what you need is a full sleep naturally and easily as your mind drifts, that's also is by pressing that play button on the podcast and listening to me, you give permission to your body and your mind. In fact, you give the command to your body and Drift off to sleep if that's what you want or need. And as I focus on the different parts of your body, focusing on different parts of your body. Because that drift off is basically you in your body in the sleep zone. And the more you drift, the longer you drift, and the longer you drift, and eventually that drift off continues to sleep. And that's the last you remember 
Let's focus again on parts of your body. Focusing this time on your forehead. Focusing on your fingers. Maybe you might move your fingers a little bit so you can focus on each one individually. focus on both of your hands now, they may seem to just melt into one. Where does your right hand start and your left hand end? Almost as if Focusing on your knees. Just noticing how your knees feel. Now focusing on your elbows. Focusing in on both of your elbows. Just observing the feeling of your elbows.
letting go. go letting go letting start now and I'd like you just first of all just to see yourself lying down on that massage table lying on your front your head is supported your arms are supported and you feel comfortable and the breathing is really easy and you feel You feel confident in how you look as well. So there's none of that issue of body problems or shyness because I'm a professional and this is a therapy session. So none of that stuff matters whatsoever. This is about you. This is about how you feel and how you can enjoy that sense of comfort and relaxation that comes from letting go and allowing my hands and my fingers to relax you by massaging your body. I want to start off just by placing my hands on the back of your head, just gently, just so you can feel what my hands feel like really on you, so you can maybe feel the warmth of my hands on the back of your head, and move my hands to the side of your head, not pressing but just holding them there very gently, maybe over your ears and a little bit on your face, just so you can feel my hands, so you can become accustomed to them. And now I put my hands on the back of your head again and gently let them slide down onto the back of your neck. You can feel my hands gently stroking the back of your neck to start with. Just so you can get used to the, the feeling of my hands on your skin. Get accustomed to it. Realise that you're safe. It's all good. It's all fine. And I'm going to start gently massaging the muscles in the back of your neck. Now 
this is a very trusting situation really because our necks are so fragile and to have someone have their hands around your neck in that way can sometimes be problematic for people which is why massages are quite good because it allows you to relax and to get in touch with trust to feel peaceful and calm as I massage the sides of your neck gently moving from the bottom of your neck which would be sort of near where your shoulders start I guess all the way up to your jaw your ears kind of area that side of your neck of course is a lot longer than the front of your neck. And then massaging the, the back of your neck. Especially that area where perhaps we hold tension. And as that area is massaged, you can actually feel a sense of release in the back of your neck. And maybe you can breathe it out as well. Notice how it feels. Notice how you feel. Then moving down to that area between your neck and your shoulders, that muscly area, starting to massage that area on both sides. I mean, this would be the area that a lot of people would massage if they were going to give you like a shoulder massage. Even that's not technically the shoulders but it's all the muscles that lead to the shoulders and the neck and again that can hold tension and stress and when massaged sometimes a nice deep massage is useful and you decide how deep that massage is allow the knuckles just to dig in to get to those muscles and to really relax them all the time being firm yet gentle with you Just stroking down that area to your actual shoulders, moving to the muscles of your shoulders. And maybe initially just pulling up the shoulders a little bit off the table, just to give you a little bit of a stretch, but very gently. the muscles at the front of your shoulders, the sides and the back. Again, this is a part that can really take quite a bit of pressure, quite a bit of uh, kneading, if, if you wish, to really release the tension to really 
get into those muscles and let your fingers in there and you can feel really nice. Sometimes just being stroked gently or being massaged quite strongly can all be beneficial for your relaxation. the muscles in your shoulders. And now as we move down your arms, we do one arm at a time, starting with your right arm. do is I'll just lift your arm up, just hold it to the side of you, I want it to still be attached, and I'll just massage the tops of your arms, all the way down to your forearms, into your wrists. Gently massaging that part, the softer part, which is the under part of the arm. leads to the crease in your elbow, the inside, it's much more sensitive skin, sometimes just having that stroked can feel really nice, pleasurable and relaxing. your right hand, just holding your hand in both of my hands, just pressing gently on the back of your hand and stretching the fingers ever so lightly. same time, pressing down and massaging each finger, and then starting to massage the palms of your hands, just turning the hand gently, stretching it gently, and actually having your hand held can really be an emotional experience sometimes, even if it is with a stranger, someone you don't know very well, like a massage person or a therapist maybe, because it's intimate. safe. And as I put that right arm back down where it was, I'm going to do the same with your left arm. Exactly the same. Massaging the muscles 
you are way down to your wrist. Stroke of the inside of your arm. Just being gentle or as firm as you require. And then massaging your left hand. Stretching the fingers. Massaging the palm of your left hand. Just rest your left arm back down. And start to massage your back. The biggest part of your body. Starting at the top. Starting again with a little bit in top and between your shoulders, near your neck, going back, massaging that area again, but this time moving downwards, taking a downward stroke. Massaging the, your back, but the, the outsides of your back. The parts where your arms would maybe rest against. Almost the part that connects your front to your back. And just massaging down firmly but gently, as firm as you want. Moving down and moving across a little bit and moving all the way down again. Being very gentle, yet firm as you choose. And eventually you get to the spine. You can massage the muscles on either side of your spine, from the top of your neck all the way down to your lower back. do that a few times. Sometimes people use the knuckle or the, you know, two fingers and just go either side of the spine. Almost just push down, go all the way down to the bottom of the spine. Each time releasing tension opening up the body, stretching your body, so that you feel more relaxed, but at the same time, rejuvenated. Now I'm going to move 
to one side, to your right side. And from the bottom of your ribs to your pelvis, we're going to massage that area of your back. I'll stretch over the other side and I'll pull the muscles gently and massage and push from one end that side all the way to my side to the middle in fact to where your spine is massaging that side of your spine the opposite side to where I'm standing it's almost like kneading bread there's that big area which is firm yeah lots there to massage Potentially one of the most important places to actually have a massage because you really feel it. You really feel the release and the pleasure of having your lower back massaged. It releases so much from your body that's not useful. Starting a healing process, which will continue long after this recording is over. Massaging this part of your body not only feels really good for you, it's actually fun to do. Because it is, as I said, like kneading bread. It's a part that you can really get a hold of and really massage deeply, if that's your choice. And then I'm going to move over to the other side of your body and do the same with the opposite part. kneading and massaging from the sides all the way to the middle of your back where your spine is. Pressing and kneading. Firm and gentle at the same time. And it feels so releasing. This mixture of pleasure, comfort, release, calmness, relaxation, all mixed together. Plus there's that feeling from your stomach of it's being stretched. Even though you're on your stomach now, you can feel it being stretched because that whole area is connected to your stomach. Now we're going to move, we'll move further up to the top of your body and I'm going to do the same. This time starting with your upper back, put my hands forward over massage in that area up to your spine from the side of your body up to your spine so some of that massage area the muscle tissue uh, or whatever fatty tissue even will be possibly from your chest so it's all connected to your chest and your back connect together We're going to be massaging and just pulling some of that skin from your side up and massaging that area of your upper back all the way to your spine. And then I'll move down a bit and I can 
see at the middle of your back. Feel it exactly the same thing. As gentle or as deep as you choose. Now move up the other side again and do the exact same thing with the top of your back on the other side from Pretty much underneath your arm area, really. To your spine. And then continuing that all the way down, including your lower, your middle of your back. to your thighs, the backs of your thighs, and the sides of your thighs, starting with your right leg, massaging the back and the sides of your thighs, gently and firmly. There's a lot of muscles there. It's an area that can be very tense at times and maybe needs a little bit more pressure than the rest of the body. But that's up to you. You can gently stroke the back of your legs where you know opposite your knee joint or underneath your knee joint very sensitive, gentle area. Then working down to your calf muscles, massaging your calf muscles thoroughly and deeply if you choose. Using both hands Fingers digging deep. To your ankles. And the back of your back of your ankles. Just gently massaging that area. Maybe Lifting the leg and stretching it a little bit. Moving to the right foot. Massaging the bottom of your feet. sides of your feet, gently but firm enough so they don't tickle, and just allow the pleasure that you get from having your feet massage to just overtake you. As I continue to massage your feet, the bottoms of your feet, your sides, your arches, your heel, and if you put a lot of pressure into your heel, then it feels amazing, yet the arches need to be a bit more gentle. Stretching your toes gently, massaging the bottoms of your toes 
with my fingers, each one individually. And moving over to the left leg to do exactly the same thing. Starting at the top of the thighs, working the back of the thighs and the sides, massaging deeply and gently that whole area. Working all the way down. This is an area that maybe you could like to spend more time relaxing and massaging. So perhaps if you wanted I could make a future recording where I spend more time in one particular area. As you move down. muscles, massaging your calf muscles firmly and gently, working down your ankle and into your feet, massaging the backs of your feet bottoms of your feet, stretching the toes and massaging each toe individually, and that feeling of pleasure, the release that you experience when you're having your feet massaged, feel it. Turn over in your mind, laying on your back. I'm just going to start again at your neck area. And your shoulders. Just to fresh, because now I'm going to massage your face gently, starting off with your forehead, if your eyes are closed and you can just stretch the eyes a little bit, pushing up on your eyebrows. massaging around your scalp, massaging down your cheeks, around your ears, into your jaw, gently, the sides of your neck. chest, starting by massaging the very top of your chest, where the cold 
collarbones, from the side of the collarbone. And just nestle imagine the whole of the chest. Chest around it feels quite a large area that can move from one side to the next, moving the hairs underneath pretty much where your arms are. some of the muscles of your back in the process, moving up over your chest, and then moving down again, Just massage gently and slide down towards your stomach, starting in the middle of your chest. And then gradually the hands moving apart and massaging and sliding at the same time. Just below your rib cage. Moving down and massaging up again. Giving your chest all the attention that it needs to feel completely. So going to be focusing on your sides as well, an area that really doesn't get much attention, but feels really good when it's massaged. Just stroking my hands down the sides of your body, or just below your arms all the way down to your hips. Now, moving to your stomach area, I'm going to stand one side of you like I did when I did your lower back. I'm going to do a similar process of just stretching the muscles from your side gently massaging from one side to the next moving that whole area from below your ribs all the way down to below your belly button to the other side of you and repeat that. Process of relaxing deeply, calmly, you feel loose, you feel free. There's something about having your stomach massaged it's different from any other part because we do have a tendency of holding a different kind of stress in our stomachs that we may not be aware of. So now I'm 
inside your stomach, the front of your stomach, maybe circles around the belly button. gentleness and a freedom that comes from feeling how you're feeling. As I now move down the tops of your thighs, the muscles massaging them, I can do this with two legs at the same time, pressing down Massaging deeply those muscles in your thighs, in front of your thighs. Moving down to your knees, gently massaging the knees. Sliding down your shins, put the pressure on either side of your shin. Gently, softly, but firmly, moving down to your ankles, stroking the tops of your feet, and then with each foot on each hand. Gently massaging the whole of the foot, the top, the bottom, the heel, the ankle, the toes, massaging every part of your feet, feels so good just to let go and enjoy the process. Enjoy feeling so deeply relaxed. So much comfort and so many feelings that come just from touching your skin. Just lie there for as long as you choose, enjoying the feeling of deep comfort from being massaged by me. Enjoy. do is blow out some candles in your mind. There are going to be a hundred going to blow each one out individually, one by one, starting at a hundred as I count down, all the way down to one, and each time I say a number.
watching that candle in front of you. I'd like you to actually physically gently blow that candle out. Just this is not a big blow, it's just a gentle and that candle will extinguish. say the next number as we move down and you can just blow that one out as well and as we move down the numbers you'll find yourself feeling more and more relaxed as you moved to sleep you also find yourself becoming incredibly tired and sleepy in fact you may struggle to blow out candles as you feel more and more deeply relaxed more and more sounds where you are, you be aware of those sounds at the moment, feeling, start to just not even notice them. they're unimportant where I am I've got the sounds of the birds there's a forest the pigeon that likes to say hello sometimes and there's the odd plane that goes by seems important whatsoever the more candles you blow out the less important anything is the more candles you blow out further 
energy so simple and we're going to start by introducing the first Activity grow within you. Relaxation, sleepiness, expanding.
Ds and As. It can be seven to seven.
those thoughts, worries, concerns about the past, thoughts about the future, and even things you've been thinking about today. Just let it all go. Because none of it is useful in this moment. This is your opportunity to just focus on feeling relaxed, allowing yourself to get in touch with that natural sense of peace that we all have within us. It's available for everyone. It just sometimes takes a little bit of effort to set up the right time and place in order for you to just let go. Because when you do decide to let go and relax, what your body starts to do, it's because you've chosen, you've chosen to just allow your body to unwind, and your mind starts to slow down, and it's a nice feeling, it's a nice feeling at the beginning just to know that you have chosen to decide to relax deeply and because you've made that decision your body will just follow suit because sometimes all the muscles in your body need is just permission from you to relax because so often we're busy, we're going from here to there, we're walking around and we're doing stuff. And the body doesn't have any time or space to really relax deeply. So it kind of waits for you to lead the way. Waits for your permission. do give your permission and you give the say so when you say I'm ready it's time for your body to let go completely and relax totally your body just follows it's all right like a breath of relief the end of a day of a very physical day that you may experience in the past or you get home and you just sit down in a chair maybe you kick your shoes off and that oh, feels so nice knowing that you don't have to get up again for a little while at least and if you choose you can just sit there for maybe an hour or two feels blissful and just by sitting there like that your body knows that it's time to relax your body has been given permission from you because it's a mindset and your mind will prepare and just gradually 
looks like magic really. Because that sense of relaxation in the body is a very natural state. It's not something unusual. It may feel unusual when you first start to relax if you if you haven't really spent a lot of time focusing and giving yourself this space to let go completely and relax and it seem all most alien. But it isn't. It's actually the most natural thing in the world to let go completely, to relax totally. The most natural thing in the world to allow yourself to feel. Is almost like a literal unwinding. To allow you to press a button and all the tension just releases. And it's like a wheel, like a cog, like the inside of a clock just unwinding. And you just almost like you can see the the little wind up knob that's used is going the opposite way that it was used to wind it up. All the energy, that frenetic, stressful energy gradually winding down, losing its power, losing its strength. As the sense of relaxation becomes stronger and deeper stop listening to me for a while and your mind goes somewhere else and then you realize you're listening to me again and it was just your mind drifting to sleep which is quite natural because sometimes when we're stressed and tense we're not, we might actually be aware of what we need, either physically or emotionally, to need in this moment. But when we allow your body and mind to relax completely, and you let go of all thoughts, concerns, worries, Just 
start to focus on the mind, maybe you notice that things have come to a standstill. between the relaxation of your body and the relaxation of your mind, what you now have, feeling completely calm, loose and relaxed, really is body and the mind and the life to be able to let go of everything and to relax completely in all parts of your body and mind, even your bones.
Smiling, focusing on firstly how you feel in your body, not trying to change how you feel, not trying to relax, not trying to move away from your discomfort or stress or tension, but just accepting, observing and accepting how you feel different parts of your body, just allowing yourself to be exactly as you are, and notice to get in touch with how you actually feel in the 
expand. And I start off by focusing on the hands. Just be aware of the hands. I'd like you to move your hands around. Do kind of an equivalent with your feet as you've just done with your hands. Maybe turning your ankles, moving your feet around, making your toes gently. Really very gently. Focusing now on your eyes, I'd like you to just focus on your eyelids, maybe you can open and close your eyes a couple of times to really get in touch with how you feel when you do close your eyes, the muscles Really get in touch with the inner aspects of how your eyes feel right now. Now focusing on your thighs. Like you to gently tense your thighs, just very, very gently, just enough so you can become more attuned to the physical sensation. Maybe 
physical sensations and how I feel in my feelings right now. As we now focus on the tops of your any pressure whatsoever on your knees, it's just so beautiful, you know the sense of how your upper arms are free every single Give a good 
experience of some moving into the paranoia of autopsics. The silence of objects. How can physically
everything starts to slow down. Including the thoughts in your mind and your mind itself just starts to gradually it doesn't have to be instant but just gradually starting to it's almost like time is stretching it's a slower pace to maybe what you're used to in your day to day life it's a slower movements, which are always the case, and when you move your hand, it might seem like it's one movement, but it's lots of minute different muscles moving in accordance with each other. What happens in this space that we're sharing is we move from that big movement into those smaller Starting to focus on how your body feels, not just as a whole, not just, oh, I'm feeling this way, I'm feeling stressed or tense or I'm feeling relaxed and calm, I'm feeling this way or I'm feeling that way. Starting to notice that your body begins to present to you small feelings around your body. Small physical sensations. or not. And maybe resisting the temptation to label them or to judge them, those feelings of just thinking in, thinking about them as just being neutral. Just feelings. Noticing what your body is telling you. Feelings in your arms. Instead of feeling the whole of the arm, maybe notice those individual feelings different muscles and the skin, the hairs around the, you know, the internal parts of your arms, the veins, the bones. 
being aware of maybe your elbow on your right arm has a certain fever maybe your left wrist also has the same individual physical sensation forearm and your right arm. Your right forearm may not be any particular feeling that you could even give a name to. May not feel like anything other than just it's there. The feelings in your shoulders. Perhaps your shoulders, when you think about them, kind of almost like they're the same, you know, the same feeling. Almost like your both of your shoulders are just one thing. They're also not. Focus on your left shoulder and then on your right shoulder. Maybe you find that you move the muscles a little bit, like you tense the muscles gently. Noticing the difference. side of your lower back. Just all set connection to your buttocks and to your hips. And also moving up into the middle of the back. Sometimes, like right now actually, when I focus on that part, when I focus on my buttocks, and when I focus on my, the middle of my back, it almost felt like the muscles in my lower back were being stretched very gently. seemed to happen, the feeling of very gently stretching the lower back. And as along, you can feel it. chest. Just noticing what sensations you are experiencing in your chest. of the chest. 
chest, and she was the collarbone leading to the chest, or the chest bone. You've got the muscles in the chest. Of course, with the female, there's possibly the breasts. If you're male, you've got the different, I might not act different these days, but there may be more muscles at the top of the chest, but at the side, underneath, pretty much the same, whether you're a man or a woman, got the muscles there, muscles that stretch out to your back as well as breast tissue that stretches and moves into your back. So just being aware of your chest. Being with whatever feeling there is in your chest. And I notice that I focus on my chest. I feel it in my my back, my upper back. I guess the obvious reason would be in case you're not breathing. But in when it stretches my chest and my back at the same time. And it feels it feels okay. bit of pain in my right chest, a little bit, not pain, but a little discomfort, maybe stiffness possibly, I don't know, I notice my shoulders are also working to flex for some reason, I can actually be part of my upper back. connection between my shoulders and my upper back, so I can move my shoulders and stretch the muscles in my back, moving the shoulders backwards or up, which then moves the, I think it's the scapulas in the back. It's quite nice actually. The good thing about this is you can, if you want to, you can just flex or skid them out the various muscles in your body. To get more of a sense of how they feel. And when you're relaxing, and you do tense a muscle, and then you let it go, and you let it relax, it relaxes.
to give the power to my other body I need to be gentle with myself as your mind right now there's nothing to think about you're just my voice to listen to because you know the intention behind this recording of relaxation very least for you to feel more relaxed at the end of the recording than you did at the beginning. At the very least. For your mind to slowly relax. As your body body maybe calm your mind to the point of boredom and you start maybe to Sounds like far away from a spaceship.